weeks uh, in our basic series. These are adding to the basics, so they'll go into the basics uh, album in the back. And this will be lesson 164 in that series. There's a whole lot of lessons in that series on a lot of different topics. Some of them are on cassette because we didn't have the CDs at the time. And now these are on uh, on the uh, um, on the CDs uh, only right now. But uh, I entitled this morning's lesson, The Holy Spirit Identified, and we're going to talk a, a few lessons on the Holy Spirit. Quite a few questions that have been asked me in this regard, regarding the third person of the Trinity. And we do have a Trinity series that covers quite a bit of the uh, teachings that we've, uh, we've had in the past on the essence of God. And, of course, the Holy Spirit being the third person of the Godhead doesn't mean that He's the third person of the Godhead because He's third in rank or He's third in importance. There is equal importance if the Father whom the Bible shows as being the executor of the plan, uh, did not have the executor or Christ of the plan, then it would be no good. If you have a plan but no one to carry it out, specifics of that plan, then the plan actually is just the plan. And there are those who have to convince to follow the plan. And since the executor, who uh, is the father and uh, the executive is the father. The executor, who is the son, uh, is not here to to uh, enforce or to uh, prompt us to follow the plan. Then the father uh, told the son, the son said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, who afterwards should come after me. This is in John chapter 16. I'll send the Holy Spirit as not just a comforter and a teacher, but he's also a convictor of sin in mankind all over the world, regardless of race, regardless of age, uh, other than those who have yet to come to the age of understanding, like a child, a little child. Some little children understand, but some don't. And language. It makes no difference what the culture is in the world, what the language of those people are. The Holy Spirit knows where every one of them is because He's omniscient, that is, He knows everything. He's omnipresent. That means He's at all places at all times. And He's omnipotent. He has the power to do. And He will always do what the will of God is. And what the will of God is, is His will, the Son's will, and the Father's will. And it's always to be understood that the will of the Holy Spirit, the will of the Son, and the will of the Father never are in disagreement. Never are in disagreement. And it is not a will that they have not always known. It's not like, well, what is our will today? God never has wondered when he, we, he got up the next day and had his cup of coffee and his, his eggs and his couple pieces of whatever he eats, his meat, and his toast. He's never wondered, well, what are we going to do today? Because it's never been a day that God didn't know what he was going to do. His plan is eternal. It is also immutable, which means his plan is without change. And within the will of God, he allows us to pray and calls on us to pray that there would be occasions when our prayers, as seen in the Old and New Testament, where God repented. Uh, in other words, God changed His mind about bringing wrath on a people, whether Old or New Testament people, whether God uh, allowed a prisoner to stay in prison or re released the prisoner, as when the church, early church prayed for Peter to be released and the chains fell off of him. He was released. The bars opened up and... Not the bars where the drinking was on, but the bars on the uh, on the cell were open, and he went out. And uh, so God allows us to pray. Uh, it doesn't change who God is. It works within the will of God. And so, uh, you know, the Bible says that God's not willing that any should perish. That would include the Holy Spirit's not willing that any should perish. Second Peter uh, chapter two and verse nine. First Peter two and verse nine. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But we know that all people come to repentance because we have a will too. And so, some people believe and some people don't believe, but as Christians, we can pray, and sometimes that prayer is, is, is within the guidelines of what God wills as well, that thy will in heaven be done on earth. God's will is done as well. If uh, we're in agreement with His will, and we, we are to pray to Him in those regards. But the Holy Spirit is no less... A powerful, no less loving, no less knowing, knowing uh, than the Father or the Son. 
And uh, we must always keep in mind, as we'll look at this probably, is that uh, the uh, Holy Spirit is a person. He has his own personality. He, his essence is equal to the Father. Just as the Son's essence of who he is in his character as God, as deity, is equal to the Father. But he has his own personality. The Father has his personality. The Son has his personality. And the Holy Spirit has his personality. But they are equally the triune God. And it's, it's just faith that we understand that and we believe that. And it all is by faith. And it's probably the Trinity is probably one of the most difficult teachings and difficult doctrines of the Bible. And it's been argued ever since the Bible was translated in the, to the English. And it was argued in the early church days theologically about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was argued in the early church days and by the early church fathers and, uh, about the, and the apostolic fathers about the Trinity. They argued about how it was seen in the Old Testament Scriptures. And so there's a lot of arguments about it. And there are even those who believe that there is no Holy Spirit, such as the Mormons. They believe there's no such thing as the third person of the God. There is no Holy Spirit. And uh, that's just not true. There is. So we're going to look at some things. I'd like for you to turn to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 3, to help us to get a little understanding in this teaching. Not to, I'm, not going, I'm not going to try to make it difficult. I don't think it has to be. The technical word is pneumatology. And we'll see why that word pneumatology, or pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, is the word for wind, breath, Spirit, ghost, those four different words are used in the English, but the original word is often the word pneuma. Most of the time it's pneuma. It's when you word, add the word hagios, or holy, or separated in front of the word pneuma that is holy spirit. And so that starts identifying the person. Anyway, John chapter 3, Jesus Christ was talking with Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Verse 1 says, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. But now, he didn't say that thou art God. He said you're just a teacher. Well, I'm a teacher come from God. See, he was a teacher too. Nicodemus was a teacher of, of the Jewish thought, Jewish practices. And he kind of looked at Jesus as being, well, he's just another teacher. He's a good one. He ought so people ought to listen to him. He's a good one. But he's saying stuff that we we Jews haven't been saying. But he just thought of Jesus Christ as just another teacher. Thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Not God in him, but God be with him. The Muslims even believe that Jesus Christ is a great teacher, a great prophet. But Muhammad, they believe, came after him and, well, he's a little better. Matter of fact, he overrides everything. Well, there have been people ever since then that have come in ever so many hundreds of years or so and said, well, now I've got a new gospel. I've got a new teaching. Just like Joseph Smith came along and started the Mormon church. He said, I've got a new teaching. And uh, God in our election apparently said, I don't want there to be another God involved in this country. There's already enough nuts in the White House as it is, much less a man that believes he's going to become God when he dies. I know it's hard for us to swallow, but Mitt Romney believes, as all good Mormons do, all Mormon men but no women, that when you die as a good Mormon, you keep their faith, you become a God when you die. A God that is equal to the God who sent His Son, Jesus, to die for their sins. So God says, I'll have no other gods beside me. I might have another nut in the White House, but I'm not going to have another person who believes that he's going to become my rival when he, gets, when he dies. Because that's not true. He's going to hell when he dies. Because he is believing that he's going to become a god. He believes in a false teaching. Another gospel. And he just got it from someone else who... As many in this country have believed that he is, that Joseph Smith was just another good teacher, another good man. 
who was just persecuted for the way he did things and people don't understand. Well, Nicodemus looked at Jesus Christ as just being another good teacher. And Jesus answered and said unto verily unto Nicodemus, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot understand, as the Greek word iden, E-I-D-E-N, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter the second time in his mother's womb and then be physically born again. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say unto you, he's not talking about a physical rebirth. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You've got to be saved. And the water refers to the Word, and the Spirit is the Holy Spirit regenerating you into salvation. In other words, it is the Holy Spirit that actually saves you. It is the Holy Spirit that actually makes you the new creation. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And of course, you know the flesh is going to die. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That's the unseen part of you, the soul of you. Okay? That which is born of the Spirit is spiritual, in other words. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. This is so that you won't be spiritually dead. We're all born into this world spiritually dead, but physically alive. When we die without Christ, not only do we die physically, but we also die, we die eternally. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, though you can't stop physical death unless the rapture happens, you don't have to worry, though, anymore about spiritual death because you've been born again, born from above, regenerated, the Greek word palingenesia, uh, born again or born anew of spiritual uh, capacity. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. He didn't say it would be nice if you were, or this is some, one of the many things that you could pick out to be, and then I'll just take you along with the rest who aren't born again. He says, you've got to be born again. And you're born of water, verse 5 says, which is re reflective of the Word of God that washes you clean. And you're born of the Spirit. In other words, this is a spiritual. This is a spiritual salvation. Okay? He says, verse 8, the wind bloweth. This is in our main verses. And the wind bloweth where it wills, or listeth, or willeth. The wind blows where it wills. And you hear the sound of it. You can hear it whistling through the trees and through your window panes on a cool night or whatever. You can hear the sound of it. But you cannot tell from where it comes. Now, you might see the direction, but you can't tell from what source it comes out of what he's saying. What's the source for the direction and the sound and the force of the wind? We have weather vanes. We, I'm sure they had weather vanes of some sort then too. So they could tell if it was coming out of the east or north or the west because they could tell where the sun was coming from, from the east. And the wind usually comes out of the west. Think about how the earth turns. I mean, all that comes to mind for the most part. What drives that? Of course, God drives the direction of the earth. But thou canst tell from where the wind comes, but where... And where it goes, and then once it leaves you, is it going to go this way? Is it going to go that way? Is it going to go that way? You don't know. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And what we understand is that it is the, the, the Word of God tells us that the Holy Spirit moves in all directions at all times as full power to do spiritual things for those who are Spiritually dead. And uh, you can't see it, but you can feel it. You can experience it. You can see the evidence of it. You can see all these things. Now, I'd like you to turn to what happens. And we're going to talk about this. And we'll get back to this passage here in a little bit. But I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. We'll identify some things about the Holy Spirit. Now, we have a sheet that I've passed out, and most of you have had copies of it. It's on my laptop. I just have to shut this page down and bring it up. But it's the essence chart. It, we don't need to go through a whole lot of that, but we might turn that on and, and look at that again. 
to help us to understand the uh, Holy Spirit for, as God, as God, and the things that He has proven in Scripture to be doing and is doing. Verses 12 through 18, it says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measure themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we, are, we, we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you, you Corinthian people. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors. But having hope that when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. And not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, that is, by God, but whom the Lord commendeth, that is, the one who is approved. And so often in Christian works, where the Holy Spirit has done the work that God wants him to do through us, we take the credit for it. And this is one of the things I'm trying to get us into understanding here. And the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. We're identifying what the work of the Holy Spirit is doing. We know that it's a force like the wind. It's powerful. Sometimes it's mild. Sometimes it's a warm breeze. Sometimes it's a harsh cold breeze. Sometimes it comes with ice and snow. Sometimes it comes with smoke and fire. And it's all pictorial of the work of the Holy Spirit seen in the natural world. But so often in Christianity, as the Apostle Paul explained in our text in 2 Corinthians 10, 12 through 18, we take the credit for our works and overlook the unseen power behind those works. And we must, we know that we must sow to get an increase of souls to God's kingdom, but it is always God who is giving the increase. And we know that as pastors and Bible teachers that we must teach the Word of God to see an increase of the righteous character of Christ in our lives. But it is the Holy Spirit that actually produces that change in the Christian's life. And too often we take the credit for what the Holy Spirit is doing. A lot of writers of Bibles, uh, commentaries, a lot of writers of, of uh, workers in Christian work take a lot of credit for things that uh, the Holy Spirit is doing. In 1 Corinthians 3, 3 through 7, Paul said, You know, some of you are saying that I was baptized by Apollos and others by someone else. But Paul says that we must sow to get results, but all increase comes from God. And the one given the increase is the Holy Spirit. If you back up to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, this is a categorical study. It's not like we're doing a verse by verse exposition, so I'm going to try the best I can to tie these things together. And what we're looking at right now is that the works that the Holy Spirit does for God in the church and in the world is often credited to men. And men take the credit gladly and smile going all the way to the bank with it as far as that's concerned. The Holy Spirit's not getting a dime of it. And not the credit either. And most times the Father didn't get any credit either. Just a little lip service. But in 1 Corinthians 3, 3 through 7, Paul talking to the Corinthians, he says, Are you, you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one, for while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. God that giveth the increase. As servants of God, we should never take the credit for the work that he does through us. The slave never steals the credit from his master. And a believer should never steal the credit for what God is doing. We have no power of our own to accomplish God's will. 
We have no power of our own to accomplish God's will. And as we will see, God gave the Holy Spirit to give power to the church. A lot of people think, as they said back in the 60s, power to the people. But God gave the power to the Holy Spirit to do His work through the church. And we are nothing more than channels for blessings to others. We have no power source of our own to accomplish God's will. We have no power source of our own. Just like Nicodemus thought Jesus Christ, his source was his human genius, that, that Jesus' source of knowledge of being a great teacher and a rabbi, called him rabbi, a, a great teacher was of himself, that he came, his, his, his message came from God, but they're not saying that he was God. We have no source of our own to accomplish God's will, so we need a power source to, for doing that. And God gave the Holy Spirit for the church for its power. We as human beings and Christians magnify visible results. And so often we judge a person's success on what we see them do. We say this church is successful, that church is successful because we've seen them do this and we've seen them do that. We may judge local churches and their successes based on just visible results. But these are not our judgments to make. They're not our judgments to make. Missionaries often feel compelled to give as many success stories as possible to their sending churches back in the States and to get the support of those mission boards that have supported them to send them out there. But they do that so often they feel compelled to give as many numbers as they can to maintain their financial support from their mission boards and from those churches. And so they feel compelled to give numbers where there have been missionaries who have labored for decades on the mission field and seen very, very few, a handful sometimes, of the only people coming to Christ in those mission fields. And God measures the quality of those salvations, not the quantity of the heads counted for the mission boards or the sending churches. The Holy Spirit is the one that will do the saving. When Paul once, at one time in the book of Acts, when we studied that, Paul wanted to go up into Galatia early. Now, he preached, he did one of his earlier messages to the Galatians, and he wanted to go visit them. A lot of the old Roman retiree soldiers moved to Galatia from Rome which is could be Western Turkey in today's language, today's geography. And the Holy Spirit told Paul not to go to Galatia. There are times when the Holy Spirit tells you not to do this and not to do this. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit told Paul, don't take the offering back to Jerusalem. Three times he was told that. And he did it anyway. And of course, he got in a lot of trouble. He eventually spent two years in Caesarea and another two years under house arrest in Rome, in which those three letters that we have telling you about, were written. Maybe that's the reason why God said, well, I'll override what uh, this, this judgment that, that was brought upon you, that came upon you. Uh, not God's judgment, but uh, this lack of judgment on Paul's part of not listening. But missionaries often feel compelled to, to tell their successes. A lot of times preachers feel compelled to, to bump the numbers up. Every, every year I get a letter from the... Uh, uh, GARBC, the General Association of Regular Baptist Churches. And every year they want me to send who are the officers in the church. They want to know how many people we have and this, that, and the other. And, you know, there, there's no need to, to say any more than what it is. There's no need to say any, because the number is not important. It's not important. As a matter of fact, if you look, if, I, if you wouldn't look, but if you go online, you'll look. There's only seven churches mentioned in the GARBC in the whole state of Virginia anymore. A lot of them have just left. And the reason why is because GARBC has gone Calvinistic. That's why a lot of people are starting to leave the GARBC. And maybe one of these days we'll do the same because they're basically going Calvinistic. And we're not a Calvinistic church. So, we might line up with some holy rollers or something. No. We're an independent Baptist church. That's just an association. That's all. There's no, no dictates comes from those guys. But we have no power of our own to accomplish God's will. And so, we just need to be God's voice boxes. We need to be His mouthpieces. That's what He calls us to do as witnesses. The Holy Spirit will do the saving of those who want to be saved. But we are to be that mouthpiece. And we are to pray. We are to do that. 
Any lasting result of a church work is produced by the Holy Spirit. Ministries may take the credit for the visible results of their endeavors. And I have seen preachers, and you have too, stand up and just brag. Oh, we've got so many thousands here. We've got so many hundreds here. We've got this going on overseas. We've got this. We've got... Why are they telling you that? It's like we, we, we. Like the little three little piggies. Often ministries take the credit for the visible results of their endeavors. And preachers take the credit for the visible results of their endeavors. And some leave out the truth that if it wasn't for the ministry of the powerful Holy Spirit doing the converting and the saving and the changing of the lives, there wouldn't be anything accomplished. It is the Holy Spirit that produces any lasting results. And that's why He was given to us for power. Jesus Christ has said, I'm given to Him for that reason. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead was not personally seen in the Old Testament. He was not personally seen in the New Testament. And He will never be personally seen. But He has always produced results for the glory of God, the Father and the Son. Always. You cannot and you will never see the Holy Spirit. No man will ever see the Holy Spirit, but you will see the effects of His power when He saves someone, just like Jesus telling Nicodemus about seeing the force and the power of the wind upon the plants and the earth and the water and such. Though you cannot see the Holy Spirit, when He regenerates or saves someone who has put their faith in Christ, you can see the effects on that person's life. Look how Paul changed. Look how you have changed. Look how it draws you back to the Word. Look how it helps you to stay focused on the truth. Look how the people in the past that you've known that have been changed from one form into another have become more like Christ. That's the power that the Holy Spirit introduces when a person receives Christ as Savior. The effects of this change in your life shows the power of God in you. Otherwise, you will be as powerless as you ever were to resist sin and God's righteous commandments. So the Lord gives you that power. And the indwelling Holy Spirit prompts you to stay in tune with that power. Titus chapter 2 and verse 5 says, It is nothing that we have done that has saved us, but in accordance with God's mercy He saves us by way of the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's what Titus 2.5 says. The washing of regeneration is the baptizing of the Holy Spirit in the new birth, putting you into the body of Christ, cleansing you of your sins through the blood of Christ. And then a result of that is the conversion brought on by the Holy Spirit, saving the soul who believes in Christ. The Holy Spirit is a sovereign executive in the winning of souls, not people. I, you hear that all the time. That's one of the things I, I don't like about the sword of the Lord is they call people soul winners. That's just an old slogan, but they've used it for, I don't know, 50, 60 years people have used it, maybe longer. I guess now time does fly. It's been longer than that, I guess. But that is not a New Testament term. As a matter of fact, it's only used once in the Old Testament. The word, uh, he that winneth souls is wise. Well, I don't know why some people will take one obscure passage of Scripture and the word in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word laqua, and it means to gain the favor or to gain. He that gaineth souls is wise. And we've turned it into some sort of a competition, and we've turned it into some sort of a, of a, a mandate for the church. We're told to be witnesses for Christ in the Great Commission in the book of Matthew. But we're never told to be winners of souls because we can't win souls. And the concept of, that, of us winning souls leads us to believe that we are to be in competition against the devil. We're not in competition against the devil to win those souls. We're not in competition against the churches somewhere else to win souls. We're not in competition against the cults to win souls. We don't win souls. We are to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And so take the burden of thinking you have to win so many people or win people in order to be a Christian. We are to be witnesses for Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who does the winning. Most people don't get saved in a church service. 
Most people don't get saved in an evangelistic service. Most people get saved in their house, in their bedroom, in their car, sitting on a bulldozer somewhere, or in the military, or sitting in their barracks. I had a friend that I led to Christ, and I just talked to him about the Lord and told him how I got saved. He was from Brattleboro, Vermont. My wife and I, I, they were friends with us. And he went back into his room and accepted Christ as his Savior. Came back to my room and says, John, I did it. And I said, what did you do? He says, I believed in Jesus as my Savior. I said, praise the Lord. I had my Red Schofield Bible out. I think I was 18, 19 years old. I'd just gotten to Fort Bragg. I was 19 then. No, I was 18 then. I wasn't married yet. Of course, him and I used to run around some too back before I was married, and I was an immature Christian. It wasn't really that bad of stuff, but it wasn't church stuff either. Just the immaturity on my part, and of course his as well. Dumb in a sack of hammers, but saved. And he's still saved today. Driving a truck across the country and such and so forth. But the Holy Spirit is one that did the saving. And most people get saved in the privacy of their home or the privacy of their prayer somewhere, but not down at the end. That's all false. This has only been going on since the late 1800s. They just start running aisles in the late eight, mid to late 1800s. And it wasn't a New Testament concept. It's a evangelist. These evangelists always start something goofy. I guess some preachers do too. And some preachers who want fame, they will leave the ministry to become an evangelist after so many years. I'm now an evangelist. That's a t totally different calling with a totally different desire and a totally different dependence. But the Holy Spirit is the executive in the winning and the saving of souls. Not, not you, not I. Remember, it is God that gives the increase. We only sow, uh, we only sow uh, the water. Uh, we put the water of the Word out there. We put the seed of the Word out there. And then God has to give the increase. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts the lost person of their sin and their future judgment. That's another thing that the Holy Spirit does. You're in Corinthians, if you'll back up to the last of the Gospels, John chapter 16 and verse 8. John chapter 16 and verse 8. And I will, I will remind you that witnessing is a universal responsibility. Witnessing is not just for American churches or pastors. Witnessing is something that every Christian is to do. I witness to people on the job. I witnessed the people when I was in high school. I witnessed the people when I was in the army. I witnessed the people that I was a preacher. I witnessed the people when I worked at Parks Depot for 20 years. It had nothing to do with Faith Baptist Church. It had to do with my faith in Jesus Christ. My faith is not in Faith Baptist Church. A lot of, pre a lot of Christians put their faith in the brand of their church, the denomination of the church, the name of their preacher. That makes them feel, have a sense of security. Well, your security is not in me or the brand of church or the congregation that you're with. Your security is in your Savior. You don't die a Baptist, you die a Christian. You don't go to heaven a Baptist, you go to heaven a Christian. And your witnessing, likewise, is personal. Personal witnessing. Yes, there's group or mass witnessing, like Peter's sermons, some of Paul's sermons. Apollos' sermons, different ones' preachings. A whole lot of it has to do with not those big massive meetings is and how many run forward and get the literature and such and so on. But what in the world do you do with them after the service? Where do they go to grow up? Where do they go to experience what it means to be a Christian? Because being saved is not what it means to be a Christian. Yes, you have to be saved to be a Christian, but you can't experience the Christian life when you're just an infant because you've got to be fed. And I have found people who have come to this church who said that there are spiritual infants in the things of Christ who don't want the feed of the Word of God. So there's one thing about a little baby. The little baby is usually going to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. But a Christian, you've got a free will. You can say, I don't want to eat. I don't want to eat. I don't want to eat because I've already gotten used to eating that other junk uh, up to my salvation experience time. I've already gotten used to eating the junk of the world. I don't want the Word. I don't want to change because there's a struggle that goes on inside that says I don't want to change. John chapter 16, 
Verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I'll tell you that the truth is, it's expedient, it's profitable for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, that is Christ, it says, if I don't go away, the resur- uh, the, His death, burial, and resurrection, if I don't go away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send Him unto you, which He did in Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 1, 2, 3, where He ascended and then He uh, sent the Holy Spirit. If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. And that's the Holy Spirit. But if I depart, I will send Him to you. And when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin. The preachers don't reprove the world of sin, though He uses the word that we preach. He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He reproves the world of sin because they believe not on Me. That the word there, reprove, means to convict. He convicts the world of its sin. And when people don't want to receive the conviction that they're sinners, they turn away from God. And when they turn away from God, if they turn away too far and too often, they can become reprobates. That's what's in Romans chapter 1. He says, I come to reprove the, the, convict the world of sin. I come to... Uh, to of the work, teach the world about the righteousness of Christ because I go to my Father and you see me no more. He will convict the world of sin. He will convict the world of the righteousness in Christ. And He will convict the world or people of their judgment. Verse 11. That's what He does. He convicts the, the lost of their need to come to Christ. Now, I can stand up here and preach until I'm purple in the face, and you could too as far as that goes. But until that person accepts the conviction of the Holy Spirit upon their life that they're sinners and they need Christ, they're not going to come to salvation. They have to be convicted. And they're judged by God because they reject their conviction. Their conscience condemns them. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 3 and verse 8 that you cannot see the wind, but you can see its powerful effect. So there is the effect of someone who accepts and comes under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and repents and gets saved. That is a great effect to see, a great change to see. But it is the Holy Spirit who is the one who convicts the unsaved of their sin. He, he has to convict them before they get saved. Your, you convicting them and pointing your finger at them does, does not lead them to Christ. That's why I just preach Christ. Tell them about the gospel. Let them know that God loves them, that He wants to save them, and that they are in need of salvation. And if you will just do that and live the life in front of them, people will see that there really is power in that salvation. And the greatest proof is not in what you say, but in how you live. How I live. That's the greatest proof. The proof is in the pudding. Uh, you, you, I, my wife has made things. I know some of you have made things. And you followed the recipe. You, you said, I followed that recipe to the letter. And it didn't turn out nothing like Aunt Sarah's or Uncle Joe's or what I bought at the, at the store the other day. And sometimes we have to understand the proof is not in the recipe. The proof is in the pudding, and you're the pudding, I'm the pudding. The proof is in us. What does our testimony taste like uh, to the world, in other words? Now, I want to bring this out. If the word wind and spirit is the same thing. The wind, the word pneuma, is the word wind or spirit or ghost or breath. Wind is an unseen force. The wind can bring the blessing of rain and snow and the clearing of skies. The wind can be soft and comforting, or it can be strong and terrifying. The wind can bring in God's blessings, and the wind can bring in God's judgments. Storms, or just a little rain. We had a rain, a little shower this morning, a little after six, and I said, boy, that's a strange sound on the roof. Pray that the Lord will send us more. But the rain can come severe and be a a, a torrent and be terrifying. The wind depicts the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit can be soft and comforting, but He also can be strong and terrifying as He, as he demonstrates the will of God, but does not make a visual image of Himself so people can see it, just see the results of it. But the Holy Spirit is much more than just a force, though He is a force in a sense. Some ascribe the power of the Holy Spirit as nothing more than a righteous force fighting the devil or fighting the cosmic system, kind of like Luke Skywalker Walker versus Darth Vader in the evil empire. Not the same. Not the same. The Holy Spirit is more than a force. He is God's Spirit having His own personality and function in the Holy Trinity. He is God's Spirit. And Jesus Christ is God's flesh. Dying for the sins of mankind. The Holy Spirit demonstrates the power of God in the world. And the Son demonstrates the love and the sacrifice of God in the world. He is the third member. That is, the Spirit is the third member of the Holy Trinity along with the Father and the Son. He is the divine Spirit of God. And so often when people think of God, they just think the Father. Well, the Father is just one in the Trinity who make up God. And I have tried to explain when a man where I'm, I work on Mondays and Tuesdays where a man got flabbergasted and frustrated with something and he just said Jesus Christ, but he didn't say it in a nice way. He didn't say it in a righteous way. And I got on him. And I said, you're profaning the name of Jesus Christ. He said, I said, why don't you just use your own father's name like that? Why don't you just say your daddy's name instead of your Savior's name if you call yourself a Christian? A lot of people don't realize that Jesus Christ is God. Just like a lot of people don't recognize the unseen Holy Spirit as God. But He is. The Holy Spirit is never said in the Bible to have a body of any kind at all. Never. There are things in the Old Testament called Christophanies. Some called Theophanies, where there is a pre-incarnate representation of Jesus Christ seen like in the Garden of Eden. Other times seen in the fire with Daniel and the other three. Those three in the fire and then the fourth one being Christ. Other times seen in other ways working, fighting. Sometimes called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, making himself visible. Talking to Abraham and Sarah about having the child. I believe that was Jesus Christ. Other things that he's doing in the Old Testament. And then he came in the incarnate form in the person of Jesus Christ to the Jews as Jesus the Messiah. He, God the Son, took on a body in pre-incarnate Old Testament forms and incarnate during his 33 years. And he's, he's kept that body now. In the heavens... He has a human body. Resurrected. Crucified and resurrected though. But He has a human body. In the third heavens, He has a human body. There are other people who are up there. Old Testament, New Testament saints. But they don't have their bodies yet. They have an incorporeal type of body. But not a body that you can handle like you can Jesus Christ. Okay? Because their bodies haven't been resurrected yet and then glorified because of the reward system. But the Holy Spirit is never said in the Bible to have a body of any kind and it is assumed He doesn't need one for His purposes and His works unlike that of our Lord Jesus Christ who is visible. The Father is unseen. Jesus Christ said in John 6, 46, No man has seen the Father except the Son. Didn't even say the Holy Spirit has seen the Father. We don't know, but that's what Jesus was talking to people here in this case. But it says, Even the Father hath no man seen except the Son. John 6, 46. It is believed the Father will only be seen by men after the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, descends out of the new heaven, out of the new heavens down into the new earth, once the old heavens and the old earth are burned up in God's judgments. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. Revelation 21, 1 through 5. But the Father then will be seen. All sin and death will be gone, and the Father will be seen. 1 John 4.12 says, No man has seen God, referring to the Father in that case. However, John says, If we love one another as God has loved us, 
we will manifest the virtue God wants most seen in this world, which is His unconditional love. And 1 John 3, 1 says this type of divine love is foreign to this world. So all real love comes from God, and this love is a giving power that resides equally in the Holy Trinity, 1 John 4, 7 through 10. God is love. And that includes the Holy Spirit is also love. Everything the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit do is motivated from love. Motivated from love. The Father bestowed His divine love by sending His Son to die for our sins. The Son bestowed His divine love by going to the cross and dying for our sins. And the Holy Spirit bestows His divine love by raising Christ from the dead and filling us at salvation. Father, we thank You for Your many blessings. For your Holy Spirit, we thank you for your truth. We ask now that you bless your word. Bless us this day. Strengthen us in the faith we ask. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Vicki said I fancied it up a little bit. <laughs> a little razzle-dazzle. The Holy Spirit teaching. you got the thing going everywhere. That's what it is. I made it normal, but he dolled it up. <laughs> Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and for the many blessings you give to us. And thank you for those who can make it out tonight. We ask that you keep each one uh, uh, safe who's out there traveling tonight and some who are of our fold who are having to work tonight. We pray that you'll keep them safe. pray that you'll keep Marty safe out there on the road and and uh, keep Sheila safe who's, who's perhaps working tonight. We ask you to watch out for each each one in our church family, those that have been ill, we thank you that uh, Curtis is feeling somewhat better. And we ask you to watch over him and, and protect him and Linda, keep him safe and restore a good measure of health to, to him. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who gives us a reason to come out on a cool night like this and fellowship and have a warmth not just to our bodies from the heat here that you provided, but also a warmth from the Holy Spirit giving us understanding of his purpose in our lives and we thank you for this thank you now for all you do for us we ask now you bless the word as it goes forth in christ's name we pray give thanks amen all right we'll take this as the second lesson uh in this uh little short series and uh we are in uh if you want to um Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 14. We've got quite a few verses. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. We've got several verses as the other bus is coming in. Matthew chapter 14. And... uh, Again, this is uh, lesson two. There is a lot to teach in any time you go to talking about God, whether it's the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. And uh, we hadn't done anything in particular, and I had been asked some questions about this in the recent past few weeks. So I thought it would be a good time to bring some of this out. And actually, you know, the Holy Spirit was very instrumental as far as the uh, incarnation of Christ was concerned as far as uh, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God overshadowed uh, the Virgin Mary. And we're not on that tonight, but there's a tremendous amount of teaching regarding the third person of the Godhead. And entitled uh, the lesson tonight, uh, The Largeness of the Holy Spirit, or you can say the Holy Spirit's largeness. I couldn't find a better word for it. I looked in the dictionary and uh, largeness is a word. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the largeness of the Holy Spirit, the bigness, or whatever you want to say it, it's tremendous, just as it is the Father and the Son. But there's a few things I want to say uh, in this first uh, screen, and I'll go ahead and put all three of them up. Is first of all, the Holy Spirit is not a phantom or a Casper, the friendly ghost an apparition, as some say. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 26, and another thing too about edification, edification is not just learning uh, what is true, though that's primarily the, the case. It's also in learning what is not true. 
And there are a lot of false uh, ideas about the Holy Spirit. A lot of people get all mystical and and uh, ghosty eyed. They 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 get uh, uh, a sense of uh, wonderment, and uh, you know you can't know something that you can't see. Well, you know we're told to walk by faith and not by sight. And so, what the Holy Spirit, as we saw last time, uh, like the wind, can be very soft and warm and and uh, comforting, and then sometimes the wind can be very strong, uh, be very severe, uh, be very hot, be very cold. And uh, we, we're bringing that out, that the Holy Spirit and the word wind or breath, exactly the same word in the original language, though in context it lets you know which is which. The Holy Spirit is very powerful <clears throat> and very strong like the wind and very comforting and soothing like a, a warm, soft breeze. <clears throat> but Matthew uh, chapter... 14, verse 26. <clears throat> it says in verse, 20, uh, verse 25, uh, verse 24, But the boat was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit or ghost. And they cried out for fear, but straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. The word here for ghost is not pneuma. Uh, uh, the word here is phantasma, P-H-A-N-T-A-S-M-A, or phantom, or an apparition. You've heard of people, my sister, my oldest sister, not my sister Donna, but my oldest sister, said that when after Grandma had passed, that she went down to the kitchen one night to get a glass of water. And our there was 15 steps to the top. I remember because I counted them. Because I slipped every once in a while thinking I had counted wrong. And I had when I fell. And I remember counting the steps. How many? It was 12 to the first landing, and then 3 to the next where all of us kids had our bedrooms upstairs. And she went down to the kitchen. I think she was probably, I was 12 when Grandma passed, so she must have been maybe 14, maybe 15. And uh, it was a couple, she was a little bit older than me. Um, and she said when she went down to the kitchen, she saw a ghost of her grandmother walking around in the kitchen. It scared her to death. She went around back upstairs. Well, I don't know what she saw, but she didn't see a ghost of her grandmother. Uh, I have had people tell me that they have seen a ghost or a phantom. Uh, of a relative. And you can imagine a lot of things. Uh, but the Bible says that uh, uh, that we're not to be bringing up, uh, uh, not to be imagining things that aren't scriptural. Uh, that uh, when a person passes away, they don't go into some intermediary life or world. Uh, they are gone. Your imagination's still there. You can see a little light or something. Or maybe you can even, in your mind, picture an image of Grandma standing there. And uh, I had a lady that attended church here several years ago. She doesn't go to church anymore. She just attended for a few months. But she, on a stack of Bibles, that, you know, she's been seeing her mother and talking to her mother. And I just, to be honest with you, I told her, I said, no, you have not been talking to your mother. You may be talking to your mother, but she's not there. Oh, I think I saw her up sitting on the mantelpiece. I said, did your mother ever sit on the mantelpiece? So anyway, I'm just saying there are a lot of people who who mix up the the people who have gone on to be as if they're still here in in in, in, a, in a in a presence like that. And the Bible doesn't show that. Actually, that demonism can bring some of these things somewhat to pass. But it's not an act of God to do that. The Bible says it's appointed a man once to die and then the judgment, not to come back and start talking to you. you demonism can do a lot of things uh, to trick people, uh, to uh, to look like people perhaps. And I can I would certainly see where someone would be very concerned of something like that. But the Holy Spirit is not that type of uh, of a being. Okay, uh, he's not like uh, uh, Casper the friendly ghost. Such as the disciples supposed that image that they saw of Christ, they saw Christ on the water and they thought it was some sort of a, an apparition, a, a, a phantasma or a phantom. 
No, Christ says, no, this is me. This is who I am. So, he's not a phantom. He is fully God. Secondly, he, uh, the Holy Spirit is not an attribute of God. He's not an attribute like the righteousness and the justice, the sovereignty, the immutability, the omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, uh, and then Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit is a separate person. Uh, but he's not an attribute of God. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. And we're doing a category, this is a categorical study in a sense, though I'll put it under the basics so it'd be easier for someone to find. Second Corinthians 13 and verse 14 shows that the Holy Spirit is mentioned alongside of the Father and the Son as a separate entity. Now, there are religions in the world that don't believe that the Holy Spirit is an actual entity, that it's just the Spirit from God or the Father, but is not actually a part of the, uh, any such thing as a trinity. There are a lot of people who believe that the trinity doctrine is, is evil. But the Bible certainly tells us otherwise. Second Corinthians 13 and verse 14, uh, Paul closes out that letter. And he says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and usually when you see God like this, that refers to the Father. I'll just throw that out there. And the communion or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Numbers chapter 6 verse, I'm going to read Numbers chapter 6 verse 22 through 27. It's called the Trinitarian Benediction. I don't have that up there. Uh, this is a pull out of the hat right here thing. Or it's a footnote in my, that I, not a footnote, but a, a side note. This is called the Trinitarian Benediction. You hear it quite often. And I read this and quite often uh, at a funeral, at, at the closing or at the time when we do uh, the committal, which is the, the burial. And I'll start with verse 24. Verse 23, uh, Aaron, uh, speak, uh, Lord told Moses to speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, in this, w- in this way ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. Again, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Theologians look at this as the Lord Father, the Lord Son, and the Lord Holy Spirit. Seen three different times. Or you could have said, The Lord bless thee and keep thee, make his face shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee, and lift up his countenance unto thee. But it mentions it particularly three separate times here. First Peter. Uh, I'll just read. Uh, you've got it there in your notes there. But First Peter, uh, right after James, First Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. That we are the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So there you have God the Father. We have the sanctification of the Spirit, setting apart work of the Holy Spirit. It's seen in Ephesians 1 and verse 13 where he seals us in the body of Christ. And the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. I'll give you another one there. You have 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7. It says right here, for there are three, 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Pretty clear. 
the Trinity. These three are one. It clearly shows in these verses that the Holy Spirit is His own person, just like the Father and the Son are their own separate person. What makes them unique is that they have the exact same attributes of deity. The same attributes of deity that human beings do not have. They are eternal. They are sovereign. They are immutable without change. They are omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, all-knowing. Human beings like to think that they're all these things, but they're none of them. We can only be at one place at a time. We can't know all things. We don't have all power. But God does. Both the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all have equally these powers. Not only is the Holy Spirit distinct and separate personally, but His authority is often also overlooked. His authority is also often overlooked. Second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17. Some look at the Father as, as the one with the most authority. As Christ showed His, Christ Jesus showed His submission to the Father as an example to us how we're to be submissive to the will of the Father. He didn't show His submission to the Father because He was less than the Father or because He was without authority. He was God's representative to humanity so that we could see how we are to act. We are to act like Christ acted. And if Christ were not Christ-like, He wouldn't have shown the submission to the authority of the Father because they would never argued. They never dis disagreed. It says in 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And the phrase, the Lord is the Spirit, in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17, the phrase, the Lord is the Spirit, it does not refer to Jesus Christ, but it refers in this context to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's Lordship does not go before the Lordship of Jesus Christ, but He is equally Lord as Jesus Christ is. And God, the Father, is equally Lord. Jesus Christ is unique in that He is also Lord and Savior. So I can say, well, I don't have to be submissive to the, the Lordship or the Mastership or the Leadership of the Father. I don't have to be submissive to the Master, the Leadership and the, and the Prompting and the Work and the Leadership of the Holy Spirit because only Jesus Christ is my Lord. No, because they are equal. The Lord Jesus Christ is shown from the biblical teaching and the biblical scripture to help us to understand our place as servants and He being the Lord. If the Holy Spirit were not lording over us, we wouldn't have to listen to His prompting or His guiding because we could say, well, only Jesus Christ is my Lord, so only where I see that He gives me commands do I have to follow, not where the Father or the Holy Spirit gives me. So you this is already in your thinking. I'm just trying to bring some clarification that you submit to the Holy Spirit as well. And when we don't, the Bible, we're going to see that what the Holy Spirit does when we don't. But as God, He is still equally Lord. The Holy Spirit carries equal authority. It's not like we wait until the Bema Seat of Christ after the rapture or our death to answer to the authority of God standing in front of our judge, Jesus Christ. We answer to Him now, and we answer to the Lordship of the Holy Spirit as well. And what happens when we don't? Well, there's four things here. He convicts us when we go astray. He convicts us when we go astray. He's the one who rebukes us. And, of course, the Father and the Son are always in total agreement, but it is the Holy Spirit that is actually indwelling you as a... as And He does he can do this because He's omnipresent. In other words, the Holy Spirit can abide in a little Chinese boy or girl just as well as you or me at the same time because He's omnipresent. And He is no more... He's not too busy to deal with me. 
Some people say, well, the Lord needs to spend a little more time working on this person or that person. The Lord doesn't need to be bothered with my trouble. So-and-so's got a lot more troubles than I got. Guess what? The Lord's up to the task. He is the one who convicts us and rebukes us when we stray. And Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4. General Electric Power Company. Electric part here is Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. It says, uh, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And just before that verse came out, Paul is telling us through the Laodicean or Ephesian letter, it says, No, let no, let him the stole steal no more, but let him labor with his hands. Well, in our case of our government today, you know, for some folks that can do for themselves, let the government do it for them. But it says, Let him that stole steal no more. I think we ought to give that uh, to Congress. <laughs> but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. You see, he says, work that you might have things to give to others. Don't make somebody else do it for you. Then he says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So he's he's given them, he's, he's telling them how we ought to do. The, even verse 25 says, don't lie. Don't be angry and sin not. Let the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't give place to the devil. So he's, there are negatives in Christianity. And he, calls, he says that when you do these things, you grieve the Holy Spirit. Sin grieves the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed until the day of redemption, which we haven't gotten into, but we know that he seals us. So the word grieved means distressed. He's grieved. He's distressed when we sin. And since our, His Spirit bears witness of our spirit, guess what happens when the Holy Spirit is distressed and grieved? We become distressed and grieved because His Spirit is fellowshipping with our spirit. Now, our human spirit is not sinning. Your human spirit cannot sin. But if you get out of fellowship with the Lord, you block off the, the fellowship, you block off the comfort, you block off the, the, the information, the peace of God, the wisdom of God, when we sin, we are not just distressing the Holy Spirit, but He distresses us and our soul through the interface called the human spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. The no word in the Bible does to say His spirit bears witness with our soul, which is our emotions, our mentality, our conscience, our self-consciousness, uh, our thinking. That is all become, then that all becomes distress. And if we stay distressed too long because we're grieving the Holy Spirit because of sin in our life, the next thing that comes after being perpetually distressed is depression. And that's why a lot of Christians suffer. Depression is because they're constantly distressing the Holy Spirit. Because He could take that which is distressing to us and change it. I'm not saying that there can't be times when we have emotional and chemical things that happen within our bodies. That's just a part of life, but it doesn't hang on. Being in fellowship with the Lord actually promises the joy of the Lord. And I, I would dare to say that folks who study and stay in fellowship with the Lord and stay in the Word where they can get the Word have very little times in their lives when they go through long stretches of being distressed or depressed. The third one is the Holy Spirit is quenched. The word quenched means suppressed. It means the picture of throwing water on the fire. The Holy Spirit is quenched when we restrict the word and worship due God. First Thessalonians, Paul wrote that. Comes before Timothy. First Thessalonians chapter five. Quench not the Spirit. Now we exhort you, brethren, verse 14 of 1 Thessalonians 5. Now we exhort you, try to encourage you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. It's not talking about the unsaved, but the saved. Warn them that are unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. And certainly we should do that. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men, even the lost, as much as possible. Be patient. 
See that none render evil for evil. In other words, vengeance. I'm going to get vengeance back for somebody doing me wrong. See that we don't do that. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Then he says, quench not the spirit. And what is he saying here about quenching not the spirit? Well, he says, despise not the teaching of the word of God. When you despise the prophesying, verse 20, you are quenching the Holy Spirit. A lot of Christians quench the Holy Spirit because they don't, they let themselves spiritually dry up from the Word of God. They don't get it. Then it says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Because if you don't, you're going to quench the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit wants you to see things from the right perspective. Abstain from all appearance of evil. What will happen if you don't? Well, not only is there grief involved, but there's quenching involved. Grief is when we sin, doing what we shouldn't do, and quenching is when we don't do what we should do. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 26. He says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has their own psalm, their own song. Everybody has their own doctrine. Everybody's speaking in their own tongue. Everybody has a new revelation. Everybody has their own interpretation. And he says, let all things be done unto edifying. And the context here, what he's talking about is quenching the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21 regarding the Word of God, that no scripture comes any time by someone's private interpretation. You know, it's like me asking, well, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about this? Or what do you think about this? And you might think, well, what I think is just as important, just as good as what she thinks about it or what he thinks about it. It's not what we think. It's not what I think. It's what it says. And that's why we get into the exegesis or the language and the history and the context when we study something in the Bible. And there shouldn't be a complete division of doctrines, a complete division of... of uh, he said, in this case, they were all speaking in all different types of languages, just complete... Chaos it says in verse 40 of 1 Corinthians 14, let all things be done decently and order. When it's not, the Spirit is quenched, suppressed. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And that's what I was talking about a while ago. And in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 3, the word, it says, now the Lord is that Spirit. Not, uh not in the Greek it doesn't. It says, the Spirit. And here he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The, and the specifically identifies, in this case, the Holy Spirit. Now, because the word Lord had already identified what was going on here. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. See, you have the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross where the veil was taken away. But you also have the Lord or the Spirit of the Lord where there is liberty. And this refers, in this case, to the Holy Spirit. We're under His authority. And we can quench the Spirit. We can do that. The Holy Spirit is the one who is quenched when we fail to follow the Word of God in service to God. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 He is the one who is quenched when we lack of praiseworthy living. 1 Corinthians 14.26 And He is the one who is quenched when we have a lack of unity. Before we look at the works of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament though, and we will look at some of the works because we hear so much more of the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Because Jesus Christ said in John 14 that I can't send the Comforter until I'm gone. We're talking about His death, burial, and resurrection and then, then ascension 40 days later. I'll send the Holy Spirit. He even said there will be more things that He will do through you than I have ever done through you as far as the works go. But before we look at the works of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, 
we must begin with the knowledge concerning the eternality of the Holy Spirit, where it says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 17 that the Spirit of God, that He is the eternal Spirit. Hebrews uh, chapter 9 and verse 17, and it's just a short verse there, I guess, that He is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, 9 and verse uh, 14, I think I put uh, 17, but it's verse 14. How much, more, it's verse 14, so I'm a correction on that one. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So this is significant. And here we have Christ working in conjunction with the Holy Spirit and the Father working in conjunction with them as well. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit always work in conjunction. But you have some significant things that show the specifics regarding the, the Trinity. So we see that the Holy Spirit is eternal. There never was a non-existent Holy Spirit no more than there ever was a non-existent Son of God. There never was a non-existent Jesus Christ or second person of the Godhead, they have all three equally always existed. There never was a time when the Holy Spirit did not exist. I know that's hard for people to believe, but that's faith. All right. Phase three. The Trinity relationship. Bring these out. And I know you all are writing while I'm talking, but you'll go ahead and write on. <laughs> I don't care. You're getting it. You know this. Some of you know already know all this. It's good to teach it. The Trinity relationship. We said it before. It says here in John 1.14 that the Father begot the Son. He, and which means, begot or begotten means uniquely. Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word begotten means unique one. It is the authority of the Father to send the Son. So it was the Father who begot the Son. It was the Father. This doesn't say He created the Son because the Son is the creator of the universe along with the Father and the Holy Spirit in their own work. But the Father begot the Son. Which means that He sent the unique Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the Virgin Mary to be born and to eventually become the sacrifice for our sins. I'd like for you to turn to John chapter 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John chapter 6. And again, I can email these to you. John chapter 6. Verse 38. The Father is the planner. The Son is the executor or executor of the plan. He's the one that makes it happen. John chapter 6 and verse 38 says, For I came down, Christ saying, referring to Himself, For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, not just my own will, but the will of Him that sent me. Now, it's not that Christ, it was against His will, but he is showing his submission to the plan of God, the plan of the Father, as we are to learn to submit to the plan of the Father. That's what he's showing us. Though it's true that the, he came down from the one who made the plan to the one who would always carry out the plan to the one who would reveal the plan. They didn't just make this stuff up on, on the fly. This was already in their omniscience, their no all-knowing ability. There never was a time when the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit didn't know what each three was going to do forever. Never was a time when they thought, well, now if we make creation, you know, well, Adam and Eve, you know, uh, what if they mess up? There's no, what if? They already knew before they made them that they were going to mess up. Well, you got this loser for this guy. Well, he's just set up as far as the cosmic battle goes to give the believer the responsibility and the decision making of which one we're going to choose to follow. God doesn't always make it easy for us. He makes it clear to us. As I said about my responsibility as a pastor teacher is not to make it easy on people, just to make it clear. It's up to us what we do with it. What you, what you do with it, as it is for me. He says, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will who hath sent me. 
out of heaven, that of all that he hath given me, I should lose none or nothing, eternal security, but should raise it up again at the last day, the rapture of the church. But should raise it up again at the last day, or the resurrection of Old Testament saints when their time comes. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone who seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Son is the executor of the plan of God. The Father is the planner. The Son is the one who has shown us by His demonstration and His incarnation, His death, burial, and resurrection, that we are to submit to the eternal plans of the Father. As it says in Matthew 26 and verse 39, when Jesus Christ was at the Garden of Gethsemane, He said, Lord, if, if Father, if You would, let this cup pass from Me. But then He says, Not My will, but Thine be done. Okay? See, now, when you look at Christ, you're looking not at a separate will of the Father, but you're looking at humanity, the humanity of Christ, submitting to the will of the Father in heaven. And He's showing us that we are to, in our form, though indwelt by the Spirit of God, in our humanity, in, 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 our, in our being, we are to submit ourselves as well to not our will be done, but Thy will be done. whether it's convenient or not, whether it's popular or not, to submit to that will anyway. And we then looked at, we see that the Holy Spirit is the revealer of the plan. The revealer of the plan. You're there in John, if you turn to chapter 14. you got some, uh, some verses there. I'll put a little C there, not on purpose, accidentally. But you see this right here. This is what you call a chain reference. You're talking about a chain reference Bible. Well, if you don't have it in your margins, and I don't have these most of the time. I've got some, but not most of these in my margins. But learning the Bible, you learn these references. And you can just take where this first reference is right here, and just in the margin of your Bible, if you want to, pencil them in or whatever, you can just jot these others down, because you can turn to those. And these are Scripture. The golden rule of biblical interpretation is comparing Scripture with Scripture. This is how you defeat false teaching. You compare Scripture with Scripture because somebody might be able to take this passage, take it out of context, and say something totally different than what the Bible wants to convey. But when you start comparing it with these, you're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What does it say in 2 Corinthians 13, 14? What does it say in 1 John 2, 27? What does it say in John 16, 13 through 14? What does it say in Romans 8, 16? What does it say there? Because you just can't throw all that away because we want this or something here to match something that we're fruitcake about. This is where a lot of fruitcakes become known and become popular in Christianity. Fruitcake Christians. And you know how fruitcake, they never go away. They got mold grows all over. We had a fruitcake one time. My wife had a Tupperware cake taker. A big plastic bohemoth. And we were living in Fincastle and we put one in it. We had a little bit small refrigerator downstairs. We put some extra stuff in it sometimes. And we stuck a fruitcake in there in one of these, I think it was a Tupperware cake taker. We took it down there, took it down there and forgot about it. You know, you know this, what happens. And we had only eaten just a little slab of it because we couldn't take any more. I guess if there had been a pothole out there in the road, we could have taken it out. It would have probably held up till today. I mean, that's just, oh, there's so much stuff in it. It was, tastes good, but anyway, it had all kinds of stuff growing all over it, but you know, it lasted. And that's the way fruitcake Christians do. They'll take a verse of Scripture and won't, com won't let it teach, speak for itself and make up stuff. And stuff starts building on that's false. But John fourteen twenty six, Jesus Christ says, but the comforter, who, comforter, not the kind you throw on a bed, but the comforter, that's the Holy Spirit who comforts us, parakletos, comes along the side to aid us and comfort us, who is the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, same Greek word pneuma, whom the Father will send in my name. So the Father dispatches the Holy Spirit. He dispatched the Son first. The Father's the planner. Jesus Christ did His job. After the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Christ, the Father dispatched the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not that the Holy Spirit wasn't already working in the world, but He was sent on a different mission. <laughs> 
And I'm sure that there are a lot of times the Holy Spirit would be just as happy not to take up residence in us when we're living in sin. But the Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and shall bring all things to your remembrance. He is going to be revealing the plan to you. He shall bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. And they are always in agreement, okay? The Holy Spirit, in other words, teaches us to recall resident Bible doctrine, to recall the truth. Now, John 16, if you'll turn the page to John 16, verse 13. And let's look at verse 12 over there. We're in the neighborhood. John 16, verse 12, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you. The Lord says, i got so much I want to tell you, so much I want to share with you. He says, but you cannot bear it now. And I, I think it was for us and Christians, as Christians, there are things that I am learning now as a Christian that I couldn't have handled 35 or 40 years ago when I became a Christian. He says, you cannot bear them. There's yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. And it had to do with this, of course, is what was going to happen to him. You cannot bear them now. You're not ready for it. Nevertheless, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. This is a part of the work of the Holy Spirit. To guide you into what? Truth. And where is the truth found? It's found in the Bible. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall, uh, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come, and he will glorify me. For he shall receive a mine and shall show it unto you. All the things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. We just did Romans 8.16 just here recently. Romans 8.16, it says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. He is a revealer. He reveals to you that you are born again. People who tell me, I don't have any idea if I'm born again. Well, if they didn't know that, they need to understand that the Holy Spirit, one of the responsibilities of the Holy Spirit is letting you know if you're in the family of God or not. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, He bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. Sometimes people do doubt their salvation, not because uh, they're not saved, but because maybe they're not living right. It takes a while. I remember when I got out of the army, I was saved when I was 15. And when I got out of the army, I had got married. We had a child, Sarah, our oldest one. And uh, I came back to church here, and I just didn't, you know, I hadn't been in the Word, hadn't been in church like I should for a couple of years. And... Uh, you know, at first I, I went to the pastor and I said, you know, I, I, you know, I just don't, I don't sense a connection. I know better, but I just haven't sensed it. He said, just stay with the word, give God a chance, show Him your faithfulness, and give Him a chance to prove Himself to you. And I, and I'm glad that I did. I'm glad I got that advice, and I would give that advice to anyone here. You can give that advice to anyone. You know, after a while, you've been. It takes a while to get strength back. If you've been out in the desert and you're parched. And uh, you're you're just now getting to w get water. You just got to take it really slowly, very slowly. And it takes you a while to get your strength back. You know, Curtis has been sick, and uh, he's still reco recuperating. And it'll be a while before you can run that five mile marathon or whatever. You know, it's gonna take a little while. But you know what I'm saying? It takes a while to get your strength back, and spiritually, it takes a while to get your strength back. And that's where you have to prove that you mean business. And I've had people who who get back to the Word, but they fall off again. And even the disciples, after the Lord had had uh, gone, uh, when He was crucified, first crucified, before they saw, those couple of days before there was the resurrection, they were so distressed and they were grieved and they said, well, what are we going to do? We're going to go back out fishing again? You know, we... You know, and and then they said, we 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 have met the Son of God. There's there's nothing to turn back to. We've got to get on with it. We've got to we've got to follow Him, no matter where it takes us. And it took all of them except for John to their death. At least John the Revelator, anyway. But His Spirit bears witness with our spirit, and that's a present active indicative verb, which means it's not. 
He did it back when I first got saved. He's always bearing witness with our spirit if we'll just at, receive it into our soul. The Word of God, the comfort of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13 says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Second Corinthians three thirteen and verse 14. It says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The communion, the koinia is the word there. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And as He fellowships the communions with you, He communes and fellowships with you, showing you the plan of God. And then 1 John 2.27 says that... Uh, we don't have anybody that needs to interpret the Bible for us. As far as the Bible goes, it interprets itself. The Holy Spirit gives us that understanding. We had a lady that came to church here years ago. And after she left, she'd been here for several years and showed great promise of good, getting in, in gear to spiritual maturity. Starting to get there and asking the good questions that people who want to get to maturity start asking, the interest in the Word. And then she read 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. Well, she had somebody to read it to her. Or whatever. Or she heard somebody preach on it. And 1 John 2, 27 says, But the anointing which you have received of him, that is the picture of the indwelling Holy Spirit, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. That's the Holy Spirit here. And you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing, teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie and even as ye have, he hath taught you as, as it hath been taught to you you shall abide in him. This person failed to realize that the teaching of the Holy Spirit did not take them out of the local church and out from under the authority and the teaching ministry of a good pastor teacher but this person used that verse of scripture saying well I've just got the Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit to teach me I don't need a pastor. Well, look how much that contradicts Ephesians chapter 4. Look how much that contradicts the teaching of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy in the book of Titus regarding the responsibility of a pastor. Look how much that contradicts the responsibility that Jesus Christ laid at the feet of Peter. If you love me, feed my sheep. And here's a person who used this verse of Scripture to say, I don't need anybody to feed me. They didn't want to know the Word of God. And I have people who act like they're sincere about wanting to know the Word of God. And they're about as sincere as Adam's house cat. A lot of times people use you to get what they want. And I've had people use me in this church, use this church, use this denomination, use a doctrinal church just to get enough of what they wanted. And so I still work to help people, but I tell you what, there are a lot of people who will take a selected passages of Scripture and they will not compare them with Scripture because they don't care about the golden rule of biblical interpretation because they just want to use God for their own personal agenda. And the Bible calls that deceitfully handling the Word of God. If I took that verse and said, I don't need to go to church anymore because the Holy Spirit is my teacher, then I have deceitfully handled the Word of God because I have not compared it with the rest of the Word of God. I've taken it completely out of context. And what the context was is the Gnostics, who were the false teachers in Ephesus, where John was a pastor, where this was written, were teaching that you didn't have to follow a confession of sin. We're teaching that you could live a lascivious lifestyle. And it's okay. And they were trying to reinterpret the Bible to put it in the context of where it would match a Mormon doctrine or a, 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 a Jehovah's Witness doctrine or some other belief system doctrine or a false doctrine such as the Gnostics. And of course, those others are false too. A lot of churches and a lot of false churches use certain selection verses of Scripture here and there, but they won't compare them in context with other Scripture and they won't even take them in their context because they're just deceitfully handling the Word of God. Uh, that Mike Murdoch, who is the prosperity preacher that keeps sending text messages or uh, voicemails to my daughter's phone, you know, that she should feel guilty about not tithing to his ministry. He doesn't know her from Adam. How in the world she got on his robocalls, I don't know. And she certainly wishes she wasn't on them. I've listened to her. She showed me. Let me listen to one of them. He deceitfully handles the Word of God. And he's making a kill and do it. But you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't get killed for doing it. God will allow someone like that to stay in the ministry just to test another Christian's motivation. 
Are you in it for the money? So I heard a preacher saying uh, the other day uh, on the, my little, I get his iPod, I get his I, uh, podcast, that a lot of people go to churches. He's been a pastor for 40 years. He said a lot of people go to churches just to be, a, just to find a contact. Boys go to hook up with girls. Girls hook up with boys. People get there, try to get business contacts to kind of grow their businesses. And I've been approached in that regard before, before I became a pastor. Maybe you have too. Wrong. Deceitful hand of the Word of God. Well, the Holy Spirit reveals the plan of God, and He does it within the context of the Word of God. So God has His own plans, and as believers, we are in that plan. And all we need to get with His plan, we all need to get with His plan and stick with it. And to do this, we must bend our will and yield our will to His will. Not just trying to find a verse of Scripture to justify doing what we want to do. As I said before, I've had a lot of people. Not a, Well, I, I, yes, I have. Compared to how many people uh, I've worked with in the last, I mean, before I became a pastor, but since I've been a pastor going on nine years, when the person says, Pastor, we need to talk. And, and that's fine. I mean, that, you know, that, but usually a little flag goes up. So I wish if you leave me a, a note on the phone or something that you won't just say, Pastor, we need to talk. And I know that tone. We need to talk. And that means I need to listen. That's what that means. If you say we need to talk, let me know what it is that you want to talk about. Say, we need to talk uh, about you know, the finances. We need to work on something here. Can we ask about that? Or, or Pastor, we need to talk. Uh, uh, I had a question about something in the Bible or something at work. I was concerned about this. Or my, my daughter or my son asked me a question. And see, if I get that, you know, it kind of takes a little bit of the burden off of me. But when you say we need to talk and hang up, there's a big cloud that hangs over my head until I see you. Because every time that I've had somebody tell me we need to talk, not every time, but 75 to 80% of the time, it's goodbye-bye. It's bye-bye. I, I, I've done, I, I've, or I've gone off to this, I've gone off to that. That's what it is. 80 to 90% of the time, that's what it is. Very rarely is it uh, something to do with just a question or something, you know. So, put yourself in my shoes when you do that we need to talk thing. Because you just, you cause me to start worrying. I know, but what, is my, what have I got to brace myself for this time? Pastor, we need to talk. That usually means you have decided, or someone has decided, that they don't agree with the Bible, and they want me to try to change me the way I feel about something so that they won't feel so stupid about being so apostate or so wrong themselves. And I don't, as I had someone that came here a while back, told me, he says, boy, you don't pull any punches, do you? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, you know, if you want to get to the lean part of the meat, the good part of the meat, you got to cut through the fat. Got a little flavor in it, but might not be real good for you. The last thing, this last thing right here, we'll do this. This is the last thing. The Holy Spirit, His universal works. The Holy Spirit is instrumental in the creation of the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word beginning in the Hebrew and in the Septuagint, means in eternity past. There's no definite article. If you go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, you might see in beginning. I bet you don't. I bet you'll see in the beginning. In the beginning. Yeah, you do. There's, there's actually, uh, in the Septuagint and in the Hebrew text, there is no word the in there. And usually it's italicized. To you know, Italicized words, you know, means that the, the translators put it in to give her a better, smoother reading. So it's not so choppy. No, it's so choppy. But there's actually what we call the indefinite article, which means there is no specific identification of this word beginning. Again, a two there. Uh, this word actually is translated in eternity past. It's also seen in John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the words were with God. The word the is not in there either. In eternity past was the word and the words with God and the word was God. And here we have the same thing. In eternity past, or beginning which had no beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word God here is plural. It's not just uh, 
gods, because there is not such thing as gods. There's only one God. He's represented though the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all three were instrumental in creation. Genesis 1 1, the Holy Spirit was instrumental in the, the bara, the speaking into existence. Bara, not Aesop, but bara, speaking into existence. The Holy Spirit was instrumental in that particular decision and that particular act. And Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 through 27, the six days, the Holy Spirit was instrumental in that. And the earth, or but the earth was, Hebrew, had become without form and void. Remember Isaiah 45, verse 18. If you don't have it jotted there in your in your margin, you really do well to have it there when someone takes you to that. If you don't have it jotted down, you're not and you, and, I, and if you don't want to write in your Bible, I, 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 hey, that's fine. Some people don't don't feel comfortable with that, and that's fine. But this is a textbook for me, okay? And it's it's, it's the Word of God is is Jesus Christ, not this piece of paper, okay? Uh, but the earth had become without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That means hard-packed ice. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of these waters of the deep. Psalm 105, verse 1. No, excuse me, 150 and verse 1. Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep and the, uh, moved upon the face of the waters. These are 24-hour periods that follow from therein until the days were completed. The Holy Spirit was instrumental in the restoration. As we know the earth pretty much today, other than the Noahic flood, which still has certainly impact, but it had greater impact there. We don't know how the earth is. And between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, you know, is Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, where Satan ascended from the earth where it was his place. It was playground with all the angels as Lucifer. And then he ascended and he said, I'll become like the Most High and, and I'll have angels worship me. And God says, you know what? And I'll judge you. And he did. He judged the habitation as well. But there was not three separate gods creating the heavens and the earth, but one triune God. And the individual credit in creation goes to the Father, Psalm 102, verse 25. And it goes to the Son, Colossians 1 and verse 16. And the Holy Spirit, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Secondly, the universal works of the Holy Spirit is that He's the restrainer of universal destruction, that is, of mankind. Second Thessalonians 2, 6 through 7 says that when the the rapture of the church taking place, it says, then the Holy One of the Spirit of God will be taken out and the man of sin will be revealed and all kinds of evil will take over the earth during the tribulation period. Evil that is right now restrained. restrained. The Holy Spirit, we know, doesn't stop all evil in the world. We know it still goes on. But He restrains evil universally so as to avoid universal destruction by man's own hand. He inspires during this period of time, good men to stop evil, whether they're Christian men and women or not, but He inspires good men to stop evil. Just for your, and the Holy Spirit inspires this. Doesn't mean He indwells the lost who are maybe a good soldier or, or a good judge or a good political leader or a good lawman, but He inspires it. And I believe that God intervenes supernaturally, to inspire things that to happen that are good. Just like he inspired an overshadowing of the Mayflower that came over to America. It was a boat that was loaded, for the most part, all the time with wine. It was a wine-carrying ship, not a very big ship. And the floors were just soaked with wine all the time. And... A lot of those who travel in the other ships, they had trouble and sickness and death. And this stuff, the alcoholic content was still in this boat. And it actually preserved everyone except one person coming all the way to America. Divine Providence. the Christopher Columbus. Divine Providence. When he was going to quit, he decided to 
to go a little further. I'm kind of glad that he went into the Indies instead of setting up camp in in the, in America. Because we'd have been like Latin America. We'd have been a Catholic country. And we would look like Central and South America who are predominantly Catholic, who have a, a, a liberation theology form of social justice that is trying to take over this country. And that's another whole teaching on itself. And then the third one is the Holy Spirit convicts sinners and saves those who believe. John 16 and verse 8. And He speaks every language there is. You might think, boy, if I don't learn that language, I won't be able to communicate. I'm going to tell you what the Holy Spirit knows how to communicate. <laughs> he doesn't live in the unsaved, but He knows how to convict the lost of their sin. John 16, 8 through 10 teaches us that. So there's a universal work of the Holy Spirit, instrumental in creation, restrainer of destruction of mankind universally, though there's still evil out there. He restrains it through His force. God gives him that free will to do that because he has the power and the omnipotence and the omniscience and the omnipresence to do it. He's powerful. The Holy Spirit, he's large. He's powerful. And he has a big ministry. His big, the big ministry of God on the earth now is the Holy Spirit. Christ right now, though he is in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, he is right now in session as our high priest at the throne of the Father, interceding for us constantly. And though He is with you, He says, I'll be with you to the end. But He says, until I go, the Comforter can't come. And the Father sent the Comforter. And now His presence is upon the earth. Though He is unseen, His force is not unseen. So, and during the interim, the Holy Spirit works to our life witness and our gospel witness to draw others to Jesus Christ. And we have two kinds of witness in our life. We have a life witness, our personal living witness. And then we have a gospel witness. And when you've got both, then you really can be convincing. And the Lord can really use you at a, at a drop of a hat. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the strength of your word, the convenience uh, that you make it so understandable to us through your indwelling spirit, through your written word. We thank you for the inspiration of scripture. We thank you that we don't have to scratch our heads, but so long, because you know, if we'll stay in your word, you'll make it known to us, even if we have to learn some other book of the Bible or some other passage where we start to see the light. Thank you, Father, for the truth. Thank you for your indwelling Spirit. And most of all, at this point, we thank you for saving us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. We ask now your blessings upon us and safety as we travel and go home this evening. In Christ's name we pray and give thanks. Amen. All right, if you would, forget going this morning. We know how it is. On We've been through plenty of these uh, Christmas uh, dinner Sundays. and We always enjoy it, and at the same time, we always realize that this is the Lord that keeps us together in His Word, that strengthens our faith, strengthens our resolve, gives us the courage to face the difficulties that we all face individually and as a church and as a country. So we ask for continued understanding of the Scriptures and the importance of sticking with the Scriptures. We're going to turn, if you would, to Second Peter chapter 1 this morning. We're continuing our study in the Holy Spirit. This will be our third lesson in this particular teaching, and this morning's lesson is to help get a little overview, an offshoot, if you would, of the um, time and the Holy Spirit, time and the Holy Spirit. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 19 says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, original language, the definite article that comes before the word more sure word of prophecy, and it speaks primarily of the specific scriptures of the word of God. We have also the more sure word of prophecy unto which you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts, 
knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not at any time by the will of man, but by holy men of God. They spoke as they were moved or guided as a sail by the wind, as they were guided, steered, directed by the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we study this passage that you will help us to understand it and understand the links of the Word of God that your Spirit has motivated some 44 different authors over a 1,500-year span in the writing of the Old and New Testament. Help us to see that these are the only inspired Scriptures in their original writings, that these Scriptures are set apart by your Spirit as no other writings of man have ever been set apart regardless of their religious claims. We know that there are many antichrists out there, and so we know that with many antichrists, there are also many antichrist writings. Antichrist, we know, Father, has his own way of doing things, and we know that he uses religion and false religious leaders to have their own writings that usurp the authority of your Holy Spirit-inspired writings. So help us to have full confidence in the Word of God which we have. Thank you now for those who come out, and we ask you to bless your word in Christ's name. Amen. Many people will say, when you say something or quote something in the Scripture, they will offset that by quoting Joseph Smith, or they'll offset it by quoting uh, the Russellites, Charles Taze Russell, or the Jehovah's Witnesses, or they'll offset it by saying, well, the Quran says this, or Confucius says this, or the Dalai Lama says this, or the so-and-so says this, not to forget all the humanistic philosophical writers of the last 2,000 years, what they said. But their writings did not come under and by way of the Holy Spirit. And the writings that they have, do not have other writers writing in on it. It's single writers writing it. The Quran was written by one person. The Book of Mormon was written by one person. The teachings of Charles Tace Russell and the Jehovah's Witnesses was instrumented and orchestrated through his organization and his Watchtower Society. The teachings of the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama follow the teachings of the Eastern mystical religions. And there are so many that are out there today. But here we have 1,500 years of writing, and often these writers knew nothing of the other writers. Knew that did not even know they existed. Writing Scripture which complemented the writings of men that they never knew what those men were writing, complimenting their Scriptures and what they were saying. As we said Wednesday night, the golden rule of biblical interpretation is comparing Scripture with Scripture. And that's what we did in our teaching on the Holy Spirit on Wednesday night. We used a lot of Scripture because we were comparing Scripture with Scripture regarding that the Spirit of God teaches your human spirit the truth. And His Spirit bears witness with your spirit. And we talked about this in Sunday morning message last week that a Christian marrying a non-Christian, that there is never going to be a connection of the spirit of that other person until they're saved. And you're supposed to make sure that they're saved before you marry them. And my feeling is that you should make sure that they're saved before you ever get emotionally and romantically involved with them. Because too often, once you become emotionally and romantically involved with someone, You don't really care about truth anymore because usually personal preference overshadows truth. Personal preference overshadows doctrine. Personal love so often is stronger than virtue love. And that's that's for all of us. That's for all of us. It's tested in the strongest of Christians. It's proven in the Bible where there were men or women who had a 
personal love for their child so much that they were willing to kill the other mother's child as Sarah was a righteous woman and when she saw that her son Isaac was being picked on by the bondmaid Ishmael, her son, uh, Hagar's son Ishmael, she wanted Ishmael ba- banished. Do away with him. Get him out of here. I don't want to ever see him again. And it was her asking her husband to have sex with this woman to have this offspring because she became more, she was more personally involved in what she thought would be the happiness of her and her husband over what the Word of God said. Her emotions did not think through how much she would despise this child if God kept His Word. And Christians often do not realize how much they will despise their unsaved mate because they themselves did not keep the Word of God in their own selection of a mate. And so often God gets the blame. Human good is always seen to be more and greater than divine good. And we have to have the doctrine in our soul and have the personal integrity to say enough is enough. The truth is the truth, and we must speak the truth. Speak the truth. The servant is not greater than his master. But we have the Holy Spirit giving us understanding of the truth. He moved. These men were moved as God spoke, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God in the third person. So we talked a good bit about some of these things uh, Wednesday night. Comparing Scripture with Scripture. That you, if you want to have fellowship with another person, then they have to have a human spirit. They have to be saved. You can't just fellowship on a spiritual level with people who are just sukikos or just soulish. They have to be pneumatikos. It's like talking to an empty suit when it comes to spiritual things. I've seen too many people have a a bull ring in the nose of the person they're trying to drag in, drag around, to try to see if they can get them into church, get them fixed, get them straightened out, so that then in turn it'll be all right with them and God. And I'm sick of it. Fix this person for me. So that God can bless me. Men do it. Women do it. And God says, if you expect to end up right, you've got to start right. And so often we're not interested in starting right. We're just interested in satisfying ourselves. And so often selfishness leads to pride. And that pride leads to destruction and a mighty fall. And so often people will take their finger and point it in the face of the person who tells them the truth like Nathan had to tell the truth to David in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And unless Nathan had told Samuel his error, Samuel would have committed the sinning unto death. So, so often a pastor has to do what he does to keep God's people from sinning unto death in disobedience. And that includes the preachers as well. Matter of fact, according to James chapter 3 and verse 1, he gets the double judgment. I feel a sense of greater judgment. And God's Spirit throws it on me. He says, My brethren, be not many teachers, knowing that we, that is teachers of the Word of God, shall receive the greater judgment. And the word greater is mega. Mega judgment. You're not going to receive, if you're not a pastor, you're not going to receive mega judgment. You're going to be judged. Your works will be judged, not for heaven or hell, but for reward or loss or reward. But preachers all receive mega judgment. And, you know, you sense that. You sense that. You sense it in your conscience. And that's why we are, as a group, mostly pastors, are very sensitive creatures. Because the Spirit of God presses our spirit in a way that it does not press the rank and file spirit in the church. Because we are under double judgment. And you will never face yourself that sense of double judgment. So that's why we are a sensitive bunch sometimes. And that's why we 
say more than we should at times. We like to swing the pendulum, try to get the tide going in a spiritual progressive way. Spiritually progressive, not politically progressive. <laughs> All right. But I said those things to say this, that we are under the full-time ministry and the desire of God to work His spiritual work in us. The Holy Spirit has always lived. The Holy Spirit has eternal life, as we said the other night. And that is one of His divine attributes. Once His part in the work of creation was accomplished, which we went over Wednesday night, once His part in the work of creation was accomplished, he had more to do, much more to do. Think about this. After Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, he had much more to do in the dealings with mankind. The dispensations are the errors of the progressive revealed will of God to man. And this is where I want to bring these out as a reminder to us that this was the work of God. And I can send these to you by email if you want them. But the Holy Spirit was at work in this era, this first era. And if you'll look at this, you'll see the Bible. We're going to, if we've got time, we're going to go through the entire Bible this morning. We're not going to turn every page and every chapter. As a matter of fact, it's a short. So this is, this is uh, uh, one of these times when I take my coat off. In 20 minutes, we're going to teach the entire Bible. No, we're not going to teach the entire Bible. But first, the Holy Spirit went to work in the Garden of Eden in the era of innocence, the time of innocence. Genesis 1, verse 28, through chapter 3 and verse 6. The era of innocence. Some call it the age of perfection. The test of the tree of the knowledge of human good and evil was there. It was... With, it ended with Adam and Eve's disobedience and the curse of expulsion from the garden and the tree of life. There was a test, and that test was failed. And you know that Satan said to Eve that, you know, don't worry about what God says. Well, God, you know, God's not all that. Of course, and when anyone goes to telling you that God is not all that, then you need to remind them that He is and just leave them alone. As Paul said, he turned Alexander the coppersmith over to Satan. Maybe you can do the same to people as well. It says, The serpent was more subtle than the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, that is, the serpent said, or Satan, Hath God said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. There's a reminder there that people will question your faith. Expect it. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. He's the father of lies. And for God knoweth that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. That's human good, not divine good, because divine good said don't touch it. This is human good and evil. And of course, you know, they took of the fruit. We know after this terrible tragedy that happened in Connecticut Friday morning at 9.30, when people asked, you know, where was God? Why didn't He stop this madman? And Mike Huckabee said on his show where he was interviewed, he's the gov former governor of Arkansas who ran for president as a uh, conservative, I think, pretty much, or evangelical Christian man. He said that you'll see God in the love and the care and the hugging and the sharing and the comfort, you'll see God in that. But what you saw and what that man did was evil. And the, the attack by Satan and unbelievers and ignorant believers is based on Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. Human good. Human good or human righteousness. Not divine good and divine righteousness, but human goody two-shoe. Human righteousness. Human standard of what's right and wrong. And a human standard of what is right and wrong is that God should stop other people from their evil. God should have killed that man or paralyzed that man or done something to stop that man from the evil that he perpetrated. But what about the evil that you perpetrate? What about the evil thoughts that molest you? What about the temptation that you start to fall into? What about your secret sins? 
What about what? I know I've told people this. What about that? What about this? The man that's going to commit adultery. Why doesn't God kill him before he does, before he destroys a family? Or the woman that's going to do that. Why doesn't God destroy her before she destroys a family? Sin is sin is sin. The man that's going to rob his employees of their Christmas bonus as my former employee was going to do before. Why didn't God kill him for stealing from his people? There's an awful lot of bad that goes on. But human good picks and chooses what it thinks is right and not right. Human good, human righteousness often questions the integrity of God. And Satan in Genesis chapter 3 questioned to Eve the integrity of God. And when someone questions the integrity and the kindness and the love and the goodness of God, you have to stand up for the truth. For the truth. You see, when people question the integrity of God, when evil men do things, Satan gets off the hook and God is blamed for the evil. And that's what Satan has been working to do ever since the Garden of Eden because he is evil from the core, not from his creation, but from his disobedience. And he has accused God of not caring. He has accused God of being unfair, unloving. And he works out that cosmic evil through what is known as the cosmic conflict. And most unbelievers fall into that hook, line, and sinker. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians do too. A lot of Christians question why God let something happen too. God is not the one that let it happen. An evil person is the one that made it happen. The Holy Spirit has a lot of work to do. Then there's our second, the era of conscience. You're going up to the next chapter, next part of the Bible, Genesis 4 through chapter 8 and verse 14. That's the era of conscience. Okay? It got pretty evil. And that, after that era of innocence, it got pretty evil. And in the era of conscience, this was a test to choose to abstain from evil. But would they choose to abstain from evil? This was the period that went up to Noah the period that went up to Noah, well, they choose to abstain from evil. And there were many generations that passed. If you'll read from Genesis 3, 6 on up to uh, on up through chapter 8, you will see that there were piles of generations of people. Some believe that there were thousands of years between Genesis and the garden and Genesis teaching on the flood. Thousands of years. Some say up to 4,000 years of human history transpired because of the longevity of the lives of the people who lived in those days. Some people might look at the generations that are seen in those chapters and say, well, that would only equal so many. That's in today's numbers, but not in the numbers of that day. If you look at Noah, how long, you know, Noah, didn't, they didn't live as long then. But if you go back with Adam and Eve and then their children and their children's children, how many Years that they lived before that time. Some believe it was up to 4,000 years from the time of the garden to the time of the flood. Some say just two, some say four. I'm more inclined to give towards the longer period. But those tests for those people was to choose to abstain from evil. But it ended with a moral corruption. And the flood of Noah wiped out all but eight souls. It ended in satanic moral corruption. There again, Satan attacked again. Satan attacked again. And the human race was genetically altered by these fallen demons, who these demons who had intercourse, and there was this great Nephilim or these great uh, godlike creatures that were upon the earth. And if you realize that the mythological characters that are brought to pass in the Roman mythological characters and the Greek mythological characters that we still talk about today, Jupiter and Zeus and Venus and Mars and all these, and others as well. You have the Greek names and you have the Roman names. Well, those are actually the, those are the, actually the Stories that were told by Noah's family after the flood of what humans had become prior to the flood. And they were called the Nephilim. And these became known as the spirits of the Greek gods, of the Roman gods. And these were known all down through, all the way up through the time 
that the Romans and the Greeks made statues of them and did such things to honor them and, and to worship them and to sacrifice to them and to make them state uh, recognized religious icons. That's where those characters came from. The stories of Noah's family telling about what those pet time, those powerful, mystical, uh, mysterious creatures of half human with half angelic or demonic strength happened and God had to kill them all. That's how Jesus Christ got rid of the demons at Gennareth was that He had them cast into the pigs. And the pigs jumped over. Of course, the demons didn't die, but what they were went into died. You can't kill a demon. Demons don't die. They don't have bodies like ours. And what this man did in Connecticut, he very well could have been a demon-possessed man. And that demon could have been the demon that was in other people, though he's still responsible for his sin nature. But your sin nature is the one that makes it available for the gates of hell to come in. But there was that era of conscience, and it proved it that their conscience wasn't too good. They were to be ruled by conscience. Man cannot rule by innocence. This thing is running on me, but I didn't ask it to. So though, if you got it all down, you've done good. All right, there's the era of human government. I think I've got the timing on like 30 seconds, but anyway, it doesn't matter. The era of human government. Genesis 8, 15, 11, 9. There you have the age of perfection. The test, could man rightly govern other men? The judgment was that God scattered mankind at the Tower of Babel. God scattered mankind at the Tower of Babel. The test, to protect human rights and human life by choosing governmental bodies to establish nations and enforce fairness laws. That was the test. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Would mankind choose to establish governing bodies to establish nations and to enforce laws of fairness within those peoples? This error ended when men would not scatter to cover the earth and to establish nations. Men tried to build an international community, an international government, of which we're trying to do in our world today. Men tried to, to, to de eventually define a universal religion. And the reason why Christianity is always suppressed, not just in America, but in other nations as well, is because it is the only true belief system. And people in their dead, beat, dead conscience know that it is. So there's going to be a push for universal religion. Well, there was in that day a push for universal government, universal religion, and it was in the area of Babylon. And the building of the Tower of Babel was its united nations, and the central worship was the sun god worship. That's the central worship of the Tower of Babel was sun god worship. God confounded their tongues, and I believe God confounded their anthropological DNA and forced men to scatter by tongue and by DNA to designations that He originally wanted them to go to, which they didn't want. So there was the error of human government. It failed, and God judged them. He forced them to separate and to scatter upon the face of the earth and to have their offspring and to have their families and to develop nations where there were laws that would protect the people, not only civilly in that nation and fairly within that nation, but also against foreign aggression. That's called nationalism or patriotism. The Jews know that better than any nation in the world. And one of the things that's heading up to the tribulation period is that the Jews will be the only nation that really understands what it means to be a national patriotic nation. America is failing. America has failed. And it's not your fault. We have got the United Nations in, I guess it's in New York City or wherever. I guess it's where it's at. Why put that cesspool in our country? And 
And we, we fund the biggest part of the money on that. Your taxpayer dollars go to help fund the electric bill and the water bill and the suites that they put out there in the, in the corridors. Your money pays for that because we're the host nation. We pay to host that thing. You and I do. We pay those Twinkies they put out there in the lobby. We pay for those old bottles of water that you see sitting there. We pay the electric bill that they're using. We pay the money for that equipment so they can understand the different languages. You see them wearing those heads. We're paying for that. And all they get is a little token, you know, dime or two in the, in the offering plate from those other nations to cover that stuff on their part. But God forced the nations to separate. And doggone it, we're trying to come back together again. The Holy Spirit is trying to work in that time to get convinced people to obey God. The Holy Spirit was not silent in the Old Testament, though we know more about Him in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. But uh, Lord willing, if I don't get through this Wednesday night, if we don't get through this today, Wednesday night, we'll finish it. But if not, if we get through it today, then Wednesday night we're going to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. It's more extensive than just Lord, or, or just as David prayed, Holy Spirit, don't lead me. There's a lot more extensiveness than that. But then there's the next one. That's the era of promise. The era of promise. <clears throat> you're going through the Bible. If you look at these verses that we've got in these captions, you're going through the Bible. You have already seen this is the fourth dispensation right now. Out of seven, this is four already. And we're still in the book of Genesis. Genesis 12, 1 through Exodus 18, 27. It was the test to establish by faith the nation Israel through the seed of Abraham and for these people to remain holy unto God. Holy unto God. The test would the nation Israel trust the promises of God or become idolatrous. Always remember Exodus 20 is the giving of the law chapter. It's where the Ten Commandments are found. This era ended as Israel became super idolatrous. Israel kept on... Remember, they built the golden calf. Remember, so many things happened. I know this after you get to Exodus chapter 20. But they were already very idolatrous. They picked up on this idolatry while they lived in Egypt and they picked up on the, the beliefs of the Egyptians. They had left the Word of God prior to their 430 years of captivity. Of the 430 years that the Jews were in Egypt, they were not in captivity all 430 years. They went down there for grain and they ended up becoming slaves. But there was a total period of 430 years of which they were there. Her judgment came in the law by way of the law of Moses. Then there's the error of the law of Moses, Exodus 19, as we're going through the Bible. This is going to take us all the way to Acts chapter 1 and verse 26. This is the fifth dispensation. The dispensation of the error of the law of Moses. And the test in this one was, would Israel obey the law of God? Would Israel obey the law of God? The people failed to uphold the law and turned on God's prophets who were driven to write what they wrote by whom? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit represented the mind of God through the pens of the writers. The Holy Spirit represented the mind of God through the pens of the writers. Okay? And what God would and would not permit, what God wanted and what God did not want. What God would do and what God would not do. The Holy Spirit was instrumental in this. Okay? And here was the test for Israel to obey the laws of God. The people said that they would obey all that God had gave but you know they didn't. The people failed to uphold the law and turned on God's prophets. And we know according to Hebrews chapter 11, they crucified or murdered or, or burned or sawed in its under or killed or stoned the prophets. Even Jesus said they stoned their prophets who were saying what the Holy Spirit told them to say. Remember the Holy Spirit, as we saw in our first passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, that no Bible 
No Bible teaching is given by any private interpretation that it comes from God Himself as He His Spirit moved upon the hearts and the hands and the minds of the writers like a wind blows the sail on a ship and turns it whithersoever He willeth or wants to do. No other writings, whether it's Joseph Smith or Charles Taze Russell or the Quran, Muhammad's Quran, all these, none of these were inspired by the Holy Spirit and driven by the Holy Spirit. They're all apostate writings. And a Christian has to be sold hook, line, and sinker on the Word of God. That's the reason why there are a lot of people who profess to be Christians, even born again Christians, who believe that Jesus Christ is not the only way. Well, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is in the only way, you're not a Christian. Because you call the Son of God a liar. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me, and a person that can in no way call themselves a born-again Christian and follow some other corny belief. The people failed to uphold the law, and they turned on God's prophets and God's Spirit, and they eventually crucified their Messiah, Jesus Christ. The judgment was Israel was universally scattered as prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 63 through 66. And that is the prophecy of the third scattering of Israel. The third scattering. And when that one was given, there was only one that had had taken place and that was the 430 years when they were back in Egypt. And then the second was under Jeremiah's day of the 70 year Judean captivity to the Babylonians with Nebuchadnezzar. And the third dispersion was after 70 A.D. This passage here, Deuteronomy 28, has to do with the 70 A.D. dispersing when the Jews were dispersed and it was promised that they would not be gathered back together again until they received their Messiah. And that happens in the second coming seven years after the rapture of the church. And the Bible says, hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And the Spirit refers to the Holy Spirit in the writing that God used the Holy Spirit to inspire the writers to write. We need to know our Bibles. The judgment was that Israel would be universally scattered. I know she's got a nation and she's got a name, but she's not a spiritual nation yet. She's going to be the nation that God wants her to be. She hasn't, she doesn't have all the land and the territory and of course all the Abrahamic blessings. The Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant and the Palestinian covenant all have to do with Israel's possession, not some people called the Palestines. That was just called the area of Palestine. The Palestinian covenant was not a government covenant that God made with the Palestinians. It was the land of the Palestines or the Palestine. A lot of people get confused about the Palestinian covenant. God made a covenant. Not with the Palestinians as we know them, you know, politically today, but the land that they live in. Because when Israel went in and overtook that land, they had, you know, the Palestinians or the Philistines, and they had that land to overtake. That wasn't a covenant that he made with Palestinians as we know them politically. That land belongs Two, the Jews, all of it does, West Bank. All that area that they're trying to establish as their own nation doesn't belong to them. It never will belong to them, not from God's point of view. And when the tribulation period is over with and the millennial kingdom is established, all that land and more will be given back to the Jews as per Ezekiel chapter 38. They own the land all the way from the area where they came up out of, uh, across the Red Sea, all the way over to the Babylonian Tigris River, all the way up to the top, up to Syria. They own every bit of that. And they just got a little old pinch right in there. But they own land that goes all the way over to Babylon, all the way up to Damascus, and straight over to the coast across Jordan. They own that land. Uh, uh, the, the, the Jews own the land that 
that the, uh, the Jordanians and the Lebanese and the Palestinians are in. They own the land that the Syrians are in. That's their land, not the Syrians' land. All that was lost through wars and apostasy on the Jews' part. You think about the, the Israel, that little spit of land right there. Their land actually goes all the way from the northern part of Egypt all the way out to Turkey and to the Babylonian Valley. The Bible teaches that. The inspired Word of God teaches that. But they broke the, they disobeyed God. God scattered them. And God didn't, didn't say that you'll no longer have the promises that I gave you, the Davidic, the Abrahamic, and the Palestinian covenant, the land covenant, that it it didn't promise them that they wouldn't get it, but He put it on hold. And the Abrahamic covenants that God made with Abraham, God sealed those covenants in blood. And God made those unconditional covenants. He had some that were conditional, some that were unconditional. But when they crucified their Savior, God didn't write Israel off and His promises to them, which He cannot lie, He put them on hold. The book of Hosea is a picture of what He did when He put them on hold. Like He had to put His wife, what a name, Gomer, in the closet before she was adulterous. It's a picture of the spiritual adultery of Israel. Then next is the error of the church. Acts 2, 1 through Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. That's a big chunk of Scripture as well. you got, if you look at it, the error of the law of Moses, Exodus 19, 3, through the error of the age of the church, Revelation 3, 22, that is a whole lot of, that's a whole lot of, a time in it. Well, that's the sixth dispensation of the church. And it is a test for all mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, to receive the Word under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, given understanding, and to live in accordance to the indwelling Holy Spirit. The failure to do so, which it will be a failure to do so according to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, it will end in a time of great apostasy, Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. The church will, there will be a great mega, a great apostasia. The word there means falling away. There will be a great falling away before the tribulation period comes. The failure for believers to live in and learn and stay under the abiding and indwelling of the Holy Spirit will come to an end and it will fail. The failure to follow the leadership of the Word and the Spirit will end in apostasy as massive numbers of Christians exit Bible-teaching churches. There will be a great exodus of professed believers leaving Bible-teaching churches, leaving the Word of God. Or there will be some who will stay in some Bible-teaching churches, but for the wrong reasons. The Spirit only knows. The judgment then and the rapture of the church is actually not just a time of great celebration for the church, but it is also a time of judgment. Every dispensation or era of time ends in judgment. You think the rapture, hey, that's home going. But a lot of people think, well, you know, we'll get the potato salad and chicken and the, and the iced tea out there and the Diet Coke or whatever else, whatever you like, and the pie and, and the cake and everything, and that's what it's going to be like, and we're going to be like, we're going to uh, a, a singing concert where everybody can sit around and sing and just prance back and forth and do the hip thing and uh, sing and daub tears from their eyes and try to wipe the mascara from running down their cheeks, men and women. Get that holy rollerish looking hairdo thing going on there. They've got the, the she buns and then they've got the the guys that have the fried he buns, the finger in the wall socket look. And that's what a lot of people's idea is it will be that when we get to heaven, that's, that's, that's all it's going to be. But you're going to be judged. Second Corinthians 3 and verse 10 says that we must all appear before. It doesn't say the happy seat of Christ. 
It doesn't say the, 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 uh, the equal distribution seed of Christ, does it? It doesn't say the Robin Hood where he took from the, takes from the rich Christian and gives to the poor Christian seed of Christ. It says it's the judgment seat of Christ. And my job as a pastor is more than anything is to help you to see the Word, to help you through your circumstances as I go through mine as well, and to prepare you for that judgment day because the billions and billions and billions and billions, and I can say this a billion times is still just getting started, of the years that follow will be predicated upon how you learned and how you acted now. And I, I cannot get people to understand that enough. One half to two-thirds of this church misses two-thirds of the teaching that would help them get ready for the judgment day of Christ. And there are too many that just don't give a flying flip. Got too many more important things to do. And I can't do anything about it. Well, you're going to answer for it. I'm going to answer for it. And if I don't do my job, I'll answer for it. And if you don't get the word, you're going to answer for it. There is so much time that I see that we can be getting the word and I have so many people that ask me questions of stuff that I have covered 40 dozen times that just don't get the teaching. I didn't know you believed that, Pastor. We've got people in this church that actually believe that they're still seeing ghosts, emanations, spirits. Good Lord. Don't get the word. Don't know. I hope other people outside of this community... Don't think that I'm some people's pastor. Because they must think we're a bunch of fruitcakes up here. I have people that ask me the most simple, mundane questions. Something I thought, I knew that when I was 15 years old. Hmm. <laughs> we're not a coop church, we're a doctrinal church. And I guess nowadays that is it. I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm one of the kooks too. I don't know. But. but the judgment of the rapture is well all is where all believers in Christ will be immediately called into account by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. No excuses. Non-believers will be left on earth to experience the horrors of the seven-year tribulation. We know. That's Revelation 4, verse 1 through chapter 19 and verse 21. That's the tribulation era of the Bible. Revelation 4, 1 through 19, 21. With this period of judgment, Israel in particular is reunited in faith through the Messiah Jesus Christ. And what we said in that this one right here, I'll find it in a second. Just give me a second here. This one right here, Deuteronomy 28, third point there. When Jesus Christ receives her Savior, then that scattering of there that is prophesied will come to an end. Now, the seventh one is, uh, is the era of the millennial. Well, I'm going to throw the tribulation period in there. That's not a distinct dispensation, but that goes from Revelation 4, 1 through 20 and verse 3. Not a distinct dispensation, but a prophesied purging of Israel in preparation for her Messiah. It is an age of punishment. You'll notice that every one of those tribulations has an age of some kind of a P, P this or P that. That was the age of punishment, seven years of universal sorrow and divine judgment on earth, especially the last three and a half. And it ends with the second coming of Jesus Christ with His holy saints and holy angels to set up the kingdom age. To set up the kingdom age. That's the era of the millennial kingdom of Christ. And it is a test of obedience to God. And it is made easier than it ever was for mankind. Universal gospel preaching for those born during that period will flow freely with no liberal organizations and no government interference. No liberal organization and there will be no government interference telling Christ how He's going to lead His church. Satan will be bound during that thousand year reign of Christ and his demons will be bound as well. There will be no confusing alternate religious views tolerated. There won't be any such thing as religious toleration during the millennial reign of Christ. As I said, universal gospel preaching for those born during that period will flow freely with no liberal organizations. There won't be a government telling you can't put a Jesus Christ on the lawn of your government buildings. As a matter of fact, if you don't put a Jesus Christ on the lawn of your government building during that time, you will not be blessed because all rule will come out of Jerusalem. 
All who enter into Christ's thousand year kingdom will be saved people who came out of the tribulation. So Christ shows Himself reigning out of Jerusalem. The capital of Israel will become the capital of the world. Zechariah 14, 16 through 17. Israel will be the capital of the world. And this era ends in judgment in spite of all the Lord's kindness and all the Lord's prosperity given to the world in that age. Secretly, men and women despise the Lord during that time, and the Lord knows it. And He will allow Satan to be turned loose for a short period to prove the hearts and minds of men. All of unsaved humanity will then be judged along with all those who are going all the way back to Cain at the end of that millennial reign. The great white throne of judgment is the judgment that's seen at the end of the millennial reign. Satan will be cast forever in the lake of fire in a special place, and then the rest of all unbelievers will be cast in as well. The earth and the heavens will pass away in a fervent heat, and then the eternal state will begin. A new heaven, a new earth. No more sin, no more sorrow, no more tears and death, forever with the Lord. Amen. There will be no more births, no more deaths, but no more tears, no more sorrow. There will be the fervent heat burning up the old heaven and the, and the, and the, the present heaven and the present earth. And then there will be a new heaven, and there will be the heavenly city of Jerusalem coming down and ascending and being planted on the earth itself. The Father will be known among all men. And all, all along, the Holy Spirit, during these times, as we're closing up here, the Holy Spirit will be revealing the will of God to men in every era of time. The Holy Spirit did not reveal the will of God to Muhammad or the Dalai Lama or Confucius or Joseph Smith or Charles Taze Russell and all these other apostates. They are an attack on Christianity. And Jesus Christ will not tolerate it. And so if Jesus Christ does not tolerate this in the future, we should not tolerate it now, at least in our personal conversing with others. There is a price to pay for speaking your spiritual mind today. And the government wants to shut you up. But when Jesus Christ establishes His government, those governments will be muzzled. Those governments will be shut up. And the only one who will be able to speak will be those who speak in the name of Christ. And all others will be judged and judged swiftly. You are on the winning side. You are on the winning team. And we need to live like winners as Christians. The Holy Spirit guided the souls and words of some 44 different writers over a period of 1,500 years. Once the Scriptures were fulfilled by the pen of the Apostle John around the year of our Lord, A.D. 95, then the book of books was closed and no more should be added. Until then, we watch, we wait, and we pray. Father, we thank You for this day and for Your Word, and we ask You bless it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Old Testament talked somewhat, though it seemed to me a little bit rushed, on in Sunday school going through beginning of the Bible to the pretty much the end of time, discussing the breakdown of the different seven major dispensations of the Bible, and that the Holy Spirit was at work in every one and will continue to be at work in the ages to come. Never will be a time when the third person of the of the Trinity won't be at work in uh, the lives of men for the glory of God. And uh, we closed last time noting that we uh, saw the Holy Spirit at work in creation. Genesis 1, verse 1 through 27. We've seen that. The work of the Holy Spirit in that regard. And uh, in uh, Job chapter uh, 26, and verse 13, I did not read that passage, but there's quite a few passages tonight, and we'll get to our point there that's on the screen in a moment. But uh, we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Uh, Job 26, verse 13 says, By His Spirit He hath garnished the heavens. That's the Holy Spirit. By way or by means or through the agency of His Spirit, he hath garnished the heavens. So apparently the Holy Spirit uh, is involved in, uh, and it says garnish the heavens. And it's an interesting word there. And uh, it has to do with uh, uh, a lot of the uh, 
intricacies of the heavens, whether it, and you know with Jesus Christ is said in Colossians 1, 16 through 17, to have created, created the heavens and, and the, and the earth there. And very clear there that he was in his position and his responsibility of carrying out the will of the Father in that regard. But the Spirit also was involved. Um, the word garnish here, uh, that is, uh, like it added the sparkle to things, uh, the little pizzazz to a lot of things. And the Holy Spirit was certainly working at that. It said his hand. Now, here we have what is called an anthropomorphism where we ascribe to God human features like the eyes of God are upon man. The hand of God, uh, the mighty hand of God, as the Bible says. Um, it says that his hand hath formed. Now, the Holy Spirit that we know is unseen, will always be unseen, but uh, his hand hath formed uh, even the crooked serpent. So... Uh, this is the Spirit of God uh, working in conjunction with the Son of God and the Father as far as the creation of the world goes. So I think I thought that was quite interesting as well. I could see this hand stretching this thing out, you know, and this looks like a good one, like a piece of clay. Here, try this one. Here's, you know, you used to take that piece of clay, and, and the snake was the easiest one to make, you know. You take the clay, and then you poke a little eye, you know. Uh, I don't know how the breath of life would have been put in the snake. Uh, I didn't have to, we didn't have to see how that happened. Uh, not soul and spirit life, of course, but uh, breath of life. But, uh, also Job 33, verse 4 says, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. It's also very interesting. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. I think that's quite interesting there. And this is a part of the work of God, the Holy Spirit. But I want us to look at some other things as we go forward. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit upon the hearts of sinners and the Old Testament. We hear a lot about that in the New Testament. We hear a lot about in John chapter 16 and verse 8, that the Holy Spirit or the Comforter who Christ would send after His ascension would convict the world of sin and righteousness and in judgment. And it's, when it says the world there, it means regardless of where you are, He is the one that does the convicting. Uh, the messengers, the gospel messengers, are the ones who put the word out there, but it is the Holy Spirit that really does the convicting. But I'm always encouraged when I go to visit someone that I can only present the Word, but it is the Holy Spirit that will do the work. And all we're to, called to do is to be witnesses. A lot, when I was in Bible college and in seminary, there's a lot of classes that we took in preaching and teaching and how to make a delivery. And I've got all kinds of books in my library on sermon preparation, different types of sermons that you can give. And... Uh, Expository preaching, I've probably got more on that than any of the others. And there's a lots of kinds of expository preaching. There are those that have great, wonderful, and extensive outlines like John Phillips. He has outlines that are almost long as a sermon, even for the shortest of books. It's like every two words is a part of the outline. There are pages and pages. I think for the book of Philemon, one chapter, what, 24 verses or whatever, He's got three, three or four pages of outline, just outline. And a lot of people use that extensively and follow that through extensively, and some don't. And then there is the uh, versions that you have where you just go by and parse the verbs, participles. There are very few that do that. Uh, I do that from time to time, and I do that a good bit in my own study, but I don't present quite as much as Pastor Frampton used to. But I want to, I want to get to the beans and the bullets of it, uh, as m more than I do the schematics of how it's done, but I have to use the same schematics for my own studies. There's different kinds, but it is the Holy Spirit that does convict. And there are a lot of times preachers believe that if they don't use the right version of the Bible, that God can't convict sinners. And there are some who believe that because we're not using one particular version all the time, 
But that's the reason why more people are not being saved. Apparently, these people don't read Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The end of the church age is going to end with a great falling away in the church. It's not because the Word is not being taught as it should be taught, because there have been plenty of times when there's been great masses of conversions of people in the United States and other places in the world where that particular version, which I use all the time, the King James, was never even taken into that country. Because it is God the Holy Spirit who takes the Word of God and convicts sinners. And it is the convicting work of the Holy Spirit that actually is the one that turns the table. I believe that, you know, that the, by the Word of God, people learn the, about themselves. And they learn about what God thinks of their life and what needs to be done. And it is the Holy Spirit that does that convicting work, regardless of your language. But I can't, I can't, nor any preacher, uh, can, uh, I've heard preachers who did not seem to be great emotional, uh, they were emotionally challenged men, but great communicators of truth that a lot of people poured into the Word of God and poured into the Lord and, and were saved. And then I've heard some uh, preach, and you'd think their blood vessels were going to pop in their head, and they did all kinds of gyrations and all kinds of stuff, and it didn't produce a bit more in salvations. And it's because... It is a timing issue. It is, does that person that you're speaking to want what you have to offer when you're offering it? And there are times when there's entire communities that just have, I used to call Botetai County a dry county, spiritually speaking. It used to be alcohol, they called it a dry county. If they didn't serve alcohol, they didn't sell it. And I have thought about Botetai County because I have covered a good bit of it and I'm not the only one. And... uh there are a lot of people who just are not interested. I think sometimes people come out to Botuck County to get away from the Bible, to be honest with you. <laughs> but they have to want the Word. And the Holy Spirit is the one who will convict them if they're of a heart to be convicted. From uh, Genesis uh, chapter... I'd like you to turn to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3. I think I've got 3-6 there, but I should have put 6-3. Yeah, it's not 3-6, it's 6-3. 3-6 is one of its own. Genesis 6 and verse 3. I'm not dyslexic, I just boo-boo. Not honey boo-boo either. Genesis 6 and verse 3. We know how it was, how evil was starting to spread among mankind before the flood of Noah. And it says... The Lord said, when he saw all this evil, and it said, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He strives with man. For my spirit shall not always strive with man. For that he also is flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. And it doesn't mean that a man can only live up to 120 years of age. It meant that in 120 years from the time this prophecy was given, the flood would come. So Noah preached the righteousness of God for 120 years. My spirit shall not always strive with man. It said in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, By faith Noah being warned of God, that is through the Holy Spirit, warned of God of things not seen as yet moved with fear. And this is what the Holy Spirit did. He moved Noah. And Noah reverenced, or he had fear of God when the Spirit of God spoke to his heart. And his Spirit, God's Spirit spoke to Noah, and Noah listened. And he was a righteous man, and he continued to stay righteous. But he says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. And here we see the omnipresent Spirit, the Holy Spirit, working on the hearts of sinners in the days before the flood. Working on the hearts of sinners as God said, My spirit shall not always strive. The Hebrew word there for strive is our word, we spell it D-I-N. Den. It's the way it's spelled in the English 
translation. My spirit shall not always strive with man or contend with men or vindicate men to me or plead with men. My spirit shall not always plead with man. So what I want us to see is that the Holy Spirit has always been the one that God has used to convict men of their sin just as He does today. John chapter 16 and verse 8, Jesus Christ said, When I uh, leave, the Comforter will come and He will convict the world of sin or reprove the world of sin. The same word in the original means to convict. True conviction comes by a person who was bowing to the pressure of the Holy Spirit to believe, to repent, or in the case of a believer, uh, to repent or and confess. When the Holy Spirit's pleading for sinners goes unheeded, it is because sinners, not because they don't have an opportunity to believe in God or the, the gospel, it's because sinners turn a deaf ear to the Word of God. And in the days of Noah, when all those sinners turned a deaf ear to God, God says it repented him that he had made man. And the word repent there means God has changed his mind in the sense that he was he wanted to hold back his wrath, but he couldn't hold it back any longer. And he judged the world. Those who turn a deaf ear to the pleading and the convicting work of the Holy Spirit are in a dangerous and a perilous place. Men can reject the, the pleading, the striving. Don't need that from Norton. Tip of the month. Thank you. A person can go so far in rejecting the pleading of the Holy Spirit upon their soul that they completely lock God out of their conscience. That happened in the pre-Noah uh, Noah flood days. And it's happened all through time ever since. Israel did that on a regular basis. And it was the Holy Spirit who worked with Israel to try to bring them to repentance. Once the human will is set against the convicting work of God the Holy Spirit, it is up to God, not us, but it is up to God to make the decision to turn that person over to their own devices. Now, God gave the people before the time of Noah 120 years of Holy Spirit convictions. The Holy Spirit was convicting people for 120 years, and He used Noah's testimony of building the ark and whatever preaching of righteousness that He could do that people would listen to. He used that to remind the people, to constantly be before the people, that God's Word was going to come to pass. And whether people will listen or not, God is going to do what He's going to do. We are up on this hill, been up here since 1959. Of those 59 years, I've been here 37. Been a pastor here for going on nine years. And we're still up here preaching and teaching the Word of God. And I, I've read the history of this church and I've read the minutes of this church since the inception of this church. I have a book on it at home. Of all the minutes of the things that this church went through up, up until the last pastor, and I have none of those minutes. I have no idea where they are. Didn't get them. I asked for them, never got them. I have no idea where they are. I have no copies of the minutes of 34 years of this church. But I do have it up to that time. And the perils that we went through, and I was up here most of the years during Pastor Frampton's ministry, at least 27 of those years, and of those 34 years. And I know that we've had our highs and our lows, and I know that whenever we would try to do this or do that, we would try to build the Word up or do this or try to find a way to, to get people to get involved Unless people were under the conviction of the Holy Spirit to do it, it always flopped. Always, without doubt, flopped. If people don't want what God's Word has to offer, the Holy Spirit has nothing to offer them. <laughs> if people don't want the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, hey, He'll go on somewhere else. 
No, not that He's not omnipresent, but the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit is witnessed when a people are personally devoted to the Lord. This nation, this community, or wherever. But once a person's human will is set against the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 1 and verses 21 through verse 24, God gave those unsaved people mentioned there, those were the Gentiles, those were Romans, Gentiles though, God gave them over to a lascivious, sinful lifestyle. And they were devoid of moral character, and which meant they were devoid of moral judgment. You see that all the time today. That's nothing new. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 13 through 19 talks about God's word being rejected by Israel. And they had a heart of unbelief. It was the Holy Spirit who was convicting them. And in Revelation chapter 22, I'd like for you to turn there. Revelation chapter 22, the end of the book of books. And I've always heard it said, and, and you probably have as well, that as long as you're here, there's hope. You know, from what we've taught and what the Bible has taught, that that's not necessarily true. People have said, well, as long, long as he or long as she's breathing, there's hope. That's not always true. Because if a person goes too far in rejecting the pleading of the Holy Spirit, upon their soul to repent, to turn to God, or as a believer to return in repentance, per 1 John 1, 9, to God, there you see the sinning unto death. 1 John chapter 5, James chapter 5, 2 Samuel chapter 12. But here in Revelation chapter 22, it says in verse 11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. That's an aristocratic imperative. Let him... Let him stay that way. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. An air is passive imperative. Let him, let him keep on being filled with, with that. If that's a person's bent, the Lord can let him just have that bent. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. These are grouped separately from the first group. The first group is unjust and filthy. The second group is righteous and holy. There are those who choose to be righteous and holy because of who Christ is, not because of who they are. And there are those who refuse to be righteous and holy because they do not accept Jesus Christ, who is the righteousness of God. And they, as far as God is concerned, are unjust and filthy. They're not fit to be in the presence of God. And we are, we, we know we're not, but we know that we are fit to be in the presence of God because of our belief and acceptance of who Christ is. And it is the Holy Spirit who convicted us and brought us to that realization, and we acknowledged it and we accepted it. We believed it. And that's why we're called believers. We believed it. So, in Noah's day, God judged the entire population of the world, except for eight souls. But people like believe that, you know, as long as you're breathing, as long as you've got breath in your lungs, there's still a chance. If a person has turned God off of God awareness, the Holy Spirit has no need to even bother with them. If a person who has not turned off God at God awareness, who believes in God, but won't accept God's terms for coming to Him through Jesus Christ, and they reject the witness of the Holy Spirit, then they have done just like those who have turned God off at God awareness. They have sinned against the Holy Spirit. And it is the unpardonable sin that is mentioned in the Gospels. The unpardonable sin is the sin of rejecting the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You can't be saved if you don't believe. Every other sin can be forgiven. There's not a sin in the book of books that cannot be forgiven except the sin the unpardonable sin. It is the sin of unbelief. God will not make you believe, contrary to what Calvinists will say. So that's the negative side of the Holy Spirit, what 
He does it in a right way. He represents the holiness of God, the justice of God, the love of God. But people cannot experience the love of God if they reject the justice of God. And there are a lot of people in the world today who want to experience the love of God and they get all blubbery and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and crying and, and tearful and they, they get all emotional. But until they recognize that they are sinners and needing salvation, they're not be saved. They won't be saved. Love is not. Let's take you back here. Love is not going to save a soul. Love doesn't save us. So if people reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit to receive Christ, love won't save them. But on the positive side, positive believers are recognized as Spirit-empowered. Spirit-empowered. In the Old Testament, Spirit-empowered. If you turn to Genesis chapter 41, we'll look at a character by the name of Joseph. You know, the one who got thrown down in the well. Not the foster father of our Savior. We're going back a few more years behind that. But Joseph, his brothers were jealous of him, threw him down in the well, and he ended up being captive and taken down into Egypt. And he was... Uh, Eventually shown to be a pretty, pretty smart young fella. And then, uh, old Miss Ruby Redlips decided that, uh, she wanted to have an affair with him and he said no. And then she told her husband that he, he ran in here and he, and here's his, his shirt where he, where he left it on my bed. And it's where she ripped it off of him as he's trying to get away from him. How she ended up with the shirt and he ended up being accused of raping this woman, which was not true. It's actually, it was the opposite way around. And uh, he was in prison for it. And while he was in prison, he heard this story about the baker and the butler. I think some of you remember that. And there was going to be a conspiracy to have a, a, uh, a killing done, an assassination. And he, he spilled the beans on that happening, and he got a pardon. He was a good person. When the Holy Spirit is heeded in leading someone to faith in God through His Son, Jesus Christ, whether it's pre-cross, like in Joseph's days in the Old Testament, or it's post-cross, where we are after the cross, this person's testimony is seen as something special, especially when they remain positive to God regardless of their difficult circumstances. And that's when you shine the most. When it's the, when it's the darkest in your life, that's when you have the opportunity to shine the most. Because that's when you have a propensity, when it's the darkest in your life, to revert back to the old sin nature and mental attitude sins and, and revenge and hate and everything else. Or whatever lascivious action. That's when people have a propensity to do that. But when you remain positive and under the filling of the Holy Spirit, when you are in a very difficult circumstance, that's when your light really shines. Genesis 41 verse 37 and this leading up to verse 37 says, And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. This thing was good in the eyes of all these. They saw this and they saw the Spirit of God working. And He was working in the life of Joseph. This is where the Holy Spirit was working in the life of Joseph. And He saw this. And in verse 38 it says, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? So you might want to add verse 38 there. <laughs> and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Now this is not the Pharaoh of the Exodus. These were quite a few Pharaohs. This is not the Pharaoh. This Pharaoh was favorable to the, to the Jews. And they worked in, in, in harmony at that time. It was only later on where the next Pharaohs that came along in Exodus who started looking about and seeing, hey, they're starting to multiply more than us. We need to make them our slaves before they overtake us. But this Pharaoh saw in Joseph a powerful demonstration of the Spirit of God empowering this person. I didn't say indwelling. He didn't understand that either. But empowering this person. 
The Pharaoh recognized the power of God in Joseph. He demonstrated, that is, Joseph demonstrated remarkable character and insight into preparing Egypt for a looming drought that was coming. He, he understood that drought, there was a drought coming. That, and he, he helped prepare that land and those people to get ready for it. They had the seven good years and the seven bad years. And they were to store up as much as they could, the best they could for the first seven years so that they have food to distribute during the second time of the, the second part of the drought. This, this, in the next seven years. Although Joseph had been wrongly accused and thrown into prison, he kept his honor for the Lord. The Lord did not let this spirit-led man go unnoticed by others. God sent His Spirit to endue and impart men with supernatural power and supernatural wisdom in the Old Testament. From Numbers chapter 11, verses 16 through 17, Moses was said to have the Spirit of God upon him, and he shared the Spirit with 70 elders who assisted him in handling the affairs of the children of Israel when they were going out into the wilderness. And that's in Numbers 11, verses 16 through 17. So, there's another example there. So, as we can see, some men were holy. Some men were holy. Noah was holy. Joseph was holy. Of course, Abraham was holy. And there were others. And it showed through. But some men were carnal. Judges 14.6 tells of the supernatural strength the Holy Spirit gave Samson in killing a lion. Samson was a carnal judge. Judges 14.6 tells of the supernatural strength the Holy Spirit gave Samson in killing a lion and in slaying 30 wicked men. It says in Judges 14, 6, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. It says, Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnah and came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion roared against him. Wasn't some old arthritic lion. It was a young lion. This, is, this old lion didn't have COPD or anything like that either. A young lion. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore him as he would have torn a kid. That is, not the lion to Samson, but Samson to the lion. And he had nothing in his hand. He did it by his bare hands, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. In chapter 14 and verse 19 it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, that is, Samson, and he went down to Ascalon, and slew thirty men of them, and took their spoil, and gave changes of raiment unto them who expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. There was going to be a, a killing if this person this person couldn't get uh, uh, Samson to tell of a riddle. And Samson told the person, and the person told the people who were going to kill him if he didn't get it. And when they said what the riddle was, I like the way Judges chapter 14 and verse 18 says, and the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, because he that was the riddle. These thirty men were going to try to fool him because he had this wisdom. And this was a riddle. You just have to read the chapter to see all of it. And then I like the way he said it. <laughs> he says, If ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. Now, he's not talking about a cow. He's talking about a woman. You had to plow with my heifer. Now, I would not use that term. Better not. No heifer plowing going on here. They threatened to kill him. And so, they... I like the language here. It's pretty good. But Samson, he said, well... Anyway, he slew him. And then in chapter 15, verses 14 and 16, you remember he took the jawbone of this animal. 
verses 14 through 16. It says, now here's a thousand Philistines. They were going to bind him. They're going to send a thousand men to bind him. Okay? And when he came up into Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, that is, Samson. And the cords that were upon his arms came as flax that was burnt, just like melted wax. And his bands loosed from off his hands, and he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand, and took it, and slew a thousand. Imagine today if you're in a trouble and there's danger all around. You run into a pawn shop instead of asking for a shotgun, you ask for the jawbone of a new ass. And he found the new jawbone of an ass, a donkey, and put it forth his hand and slew it and a thousand men with it. And Samson said with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps with the jaw of an ass, have I slain a thousand men. That's what it said. But it said that the Holy Spirit empowered him. And at last, in chapter 16, verses 26 through 31, he pushed down the pillars of the Philistines' courthouse, and thousands on top and inside, the leaders and all, were killed. But it was the Holy Spirit that empowered him to do this. But here we see that the Holy Spirit... Now, I believe that Samson turned the corner with regard to his his faithfulness to God because he he liked to carouse somewhat, as we can see. He liked to please the lady folk. And uh, he was willing to, to sell his judgeship in order to do it. And he was wrong. A lot of politicians have done this. And Samson, though we think of him as just some old slug, as far as God was concerned, though, he was like a Supreme Court judge. He had the highest authority of God in the land during that time. Highest authority. No prophets at this time, like, like Samuel and others. He was, he was the man. With God, we see that all things are possible. Even though we fail to recognize God when we're triumphant over a more powerful enemy or obstacle at times, we must believe and then act on that belief. Then we'll see the hand of God. But the negative believer fails to see God when they have success. God sent His Spirit upon carnal believers like Samson. He sent His Spirit upon Balaam. Numbers chapter 24 and verse 2, it says the Spirit of God was with him. But Balaam was an apostate prophet. King Saul was a sorry man. A temperamental fool is what he was. In 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 23 to 24, we see that the uh, Spirit of God was with him. And so, what we see here is that uh, the sovereignty of God uses even negative believers to do His will. And He used the Holy Spirit to inspire them to do and to empower them to do what they did in the Old Testament. But the sovereignty of God, in other words, God chose to continue to use Samson, Balaam, King Saul. He even used Lot, that sorry rascal. And even Eli the priest. Remember the story when Samuel was called. Hannah wanted a child and she wept because she couldn't have one. And finally she had a child and she dedicated him to the temple. And Eli was the priest there. And when he was old enough to be taken, she took him and, you know... The Lord called him in the, in, in the night. And uh, Samuel, as a little fellow, thought it was Eli hollering for him from the other room. And he went to him and he said, No, boy, I didn't call for you. Go back, lay down. And then a little while later, the Lord spoke to Samuel again. And he went in and, Eli, you called me. He said, No, son, I, I didn't call you. Go, go back and lay down. The third time, Eli recognized that it was the Lord calling little Samuel. And the Lord talked to him and he told him what he would expect of him in the future. And he had a message for him to give to Eli. He didn't give the message. God didn't give the message to Eli. He gave the message. And Eli was 80 something years old at this time. He gave the message to this little boy to give to Eli. And Eli says, I got a message to you from God. And Eli had at least enough integrity to say, don't spare me any words. Tell me exactly what it was that he said. And he basically said, you know, the crown has fallen from your head. You, you failed to be to live righteous. 
And your two wicked sons were robbing the temple. His two wicked sons, he had appointed his priests knowing that they were stealing from the temple. And he should have banished his sons, but he let them continue. And they robbed the coffers of the temple that the people brought in for the tithes. How many men in the ministry today rob God's tithes? On television, you see these men who are, and women too, robbing God's tithes and offerings to fund their lavish lifestyles, flying all over God knows where, doing whatever they want to do, going where they want to go, and people are lifting them up like they was the Savior themselves. Eli the priest was not a faithful servant of the Lord, though the Lord continued to let him hold his post. And that's one of the things that Paul prayed, that he had to keep himself under, under control. He had to keep his passions under control. He had to keep his plans under control. He had to keep his, his desire as, as, as a person who might have wanted to gone out and done this. Like Demas has, he said, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. He may have wanted to make a fortune. He may have wanted to, to be a religious icon and be adored because the Pharisees were and he was not anymore. He was a, Pursued by the Pharisees. God has always sovereignly loosed His servants even in spite of their failures. Even in spite of their resistance. Like Balaam resisted God. Samson did. King Saul did. Lot did. Eli did. Even David did for a while in the, in the, uh, King David did. And there are plenty of others that have as well. And still do today. Even good servants, even though good servants were used, God also used bad servants. The good servants weren't good because it was intrinsic within them. They were good because they allowed God to be intrinsic in them. We in the ministry might assume that God is pleased with us because we are still in the ministry. And this is what Paul was saying. I don't want to be rendered a cracked pot, a docomos, unapproved, uh, dokimos means approved. Adokimos means not approved. Paul says, I don't want to be rendered unapproved. So I keep myself under. I keep my mind on the ministry. He didn't want to be a lame duck apostle. There are preachers. You know, they say about a presidency in his last two years of his presidency. They called it their lame duck session, where they don't really pass anything. They'll just do anything because they're just riding, riding at the clock, you know, backing up and collecting their check every month or whatever. Well, I don't want to be a lame duck preacher. I've known preachers, when they get to a certain point in their, in their Christian growth, they stop studying the Bible. They stop doing new studies. They either just continue to teach the same old thing, and they never go into any other studies. They don't write new sermons. And they decide to start looking for another church where they can wrap, wring out all this other stuff and just start rehashing it out again instead of studying more things in the Word of God, continuing to build their library, continuing to study the language. you got to stay on your toes or you're going to get knocked on your seat. That's what preachers have to do. And if they don't stay on their toes, Satan will knock them on their seat. Sin will knock them on their seat. We must never bank on the premise, on that premise, that because we are still in the ministry or you're still doing something for God, that you somehow or I somehow must be special in the eyes of God. God will even use the sorriest of His people to accomplish His will. We don't want to be that sorry person as a Christian. Then we have to be more wise and more holy. Men such as Lot, Saul, Balaam, and Eli, the priest of 1 Samuel chapter 3, are prime examples of sorry servants of God. But the Holy Spirit used them anyway. Also, God did not send His Spirit, we'll get to the next point, God did not send His Spirit to indwell Old Testament believers. Psalm 51 and verse 11. Now I think you know that very well. David's remorse over his sin and his repentance was real. But Psalm 51, 11, Psalm 35 and Psalm 51 give you a tremendous insight to the psyche or the thinking or the heart and the mind of a believer who was suffering from reversionism. Where they have gone extremely, they have not just backslidden, they have gotten to the bottom of the, bottom of the barrel, spiritually speaking. 
They're on life support. Verse 1 of Psalm 56 says, Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up, and he, fighting daily, oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily, would daily, excuse me, chapter 51. It says, have, here's another, have mercy. Have mercy. Psalm 51, 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly, completely from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. This is after he had come to his confession when uh, Nathan the prophet in 1 Samuel chapter 12 showed him his colors. 2 Samuel chapter 12, I mean. He says, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He's under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. See, the human nature in itself does not convict us of sin. But the Holy Spirit does. Yes, the Holy Spirit does convict the lost of their sin, but for a believer, we're convicted all the time when we sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, he can't do like Adam and say, the woman, she made me do it. But he did know that he was born in sin. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. In other words, he doesn't want, God doesn't want a surface confession. There are people who confess their sin and in two minutes they're sending the same sin all over again. That's not really true repentance. You still haven't turned from it. This doesn't mean that you're not going to be tempted, but don't fall into it. You may be tempted in the same sin you confess ten seconds later, but don't fall into to dwelling on it. Don't do it. Don't fall into dwelling on it. You can't help the temptation. It's the giving in to the temptation, okay? Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, that is, purify me, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Divine discipline caused him great depression. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. This won't happen in the New Testament because you're permanently indwelled. You're sealed, Ephesians 1 and verse 13, as we'll see in the New Testament. If we know God did not send His Spirit to indwell Old Testament believers. King David, after grieving over his sins, pleaded with God, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. As we know, salvation has always been by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Always. Looking toward the cross in the Old Testament, according to the prophecies that were passed down through the people. And then today, looking backwards at the cross and the fulfillment of Christ's work there. Salvation has always been by grace. It's, un- it's non-meritorious. No one has ever earned it through religion or anything else. It is always by the imputation of the righteousness of God as seen in Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, where it is said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. So righteousness that is received is by faith and faith alone. So the old... Testament believers had eternal security. It was imputed unto unto Abraham. Abraham believed and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. It was, it's not going to be taken back. Second Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23 after David was convicted by Nathan the prophet of his sin with Bathsheba. And they had that little baby and that little baby died shortly thereafter. I think the baby was about seven days old. It was not old enough to be circumcised, which I believe was done on the eighth day. But the baby died. And David said that, I I know that you can't come back to life, but I know that I will go to you. He didn't say, I will go to your body. In other words, I'm just going to go to the ground just like you did. I will go to you, talking of his person, his soul, his conscience, who the little fellow was. Salvation is certain. <clears throat> However, in the Old Testament, salvation's 
assurance was not ministered to by a constant indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. So they feared. King David had seen what Saul became when the Spirit of God left him. He was terrible. He tried to, Saul tried to kill David with a javelin. And David saw what Saul had become, though many, and I do believe that Saul was a believer, though a disturbed man. When the Spirit of God left him, because he, he had empowered him to be leader and, and given him guidance, Saul turned against God, turned against the plan of God. He feared he too, that is, David feared he too would suffer the same misery. And I have been around enough believers who have strayed from the Word of God who had the same mindset that Saul had. Fearful of everything. Uneasy about everything. And when it comes to eternality and how things are going to work out in life. The deep things. Not the surface things, but the deep things. Fear. Fear would cover them. When the spiritual things were spoken of and biblical doctrinal things were spoken of, shied away from it. I've spoken with people who were here and in other places that I know and, and they changed. And they shy away from talking about the things of God. They fear. There's no love. There's no compassion. There's no fellowship with such believers. And David didn't want this to happen to him. And he liked the presence of the Spirit upon his life. Not indwelling, but in doing and empowering him. And that presence gave him some comfort. Eternal assurance was not ministered to Old Testament believers by the Holy Spirit like it is to New Testament believers. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 says, His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That didn't happen in the Old Testament. So they, they, they didn't think exactly like we think. They didn't know what we know. They didn't have what we have. We're, we are, as Dr. Bowman used to tell me at Piedmont, we are in the full blaze of God's glory and His grace in the church age. I mean, where much has been given, much is recorded. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 says, The Spirit Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And the word beareth is a present active indicative verb which is means continuously. No hit and miss. The Spirit of God is always bearing witness with our human spirit that we are the children of God. The Old Testament saint did not have that constant assurance that we have in the New Testament. John 14, 6, Jesus Christ said, And I pray the Father, He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. John 14, 16. Jesus Christ said, I pray the Father, He shall give you another Comforter, the Holy Spirit, that He may abide, minnow, that is, dwell within you forever. The Old Testament believer was one who trusted in the promised coming Redeemer. The one who would pay for their sins with his life sacrifice. They trusted in it and that secured for them salvation and the imputation of the righteousness of God as per Romans chapter 4 verses 1 through 8. As Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Trusting God was all they, all they needed to be saved. But it was all they had. But we in the New Testament have both not the full, not only that, but we have the Word of God. Now, fortunately for us, we have the full canon of Scripture. We have both the Word of God and the indwelling Spirit to comfort and to assure us. They didn't have that. So what did they have? Old Testament saints were motivated by fear of God. Whereas we have the Word to motivate us in faith. Their faith was motivated by fear. God showed His mighty power in the Old Testament. Now, it's not that we're not to have a fear of God, but there's more to that. Jesus Christ, in fulfilling the law of Moses, changed a lot of the dynamics of God fellowshipping with man. 
God showed His mighty power in the Old Testament in order to strike fear and bring about obedience in the heart, obedience in the hearts of men and women. You see that all throughout the Old Testament. Striking fear in the hearts of men and women. Crossing the, crossing the Red Sea, the manna coming down to them, the universal flood prior to that, several thousand years before, the Tower of Babel where he confounded their languages and changed their physical DNA. You think that wouldn't strike fear into people? And a lot of times people saw the miracles that happened and we wonder how is it that they couldn't, 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 uh, be motivated by that. Even in times of Jesus Christ raising the dead, doing all the things that Jesus Christ did with his disciples around him, taking that, that, uh, Five loaves of bread and those two fishes and feeding over 5,000. Some people believe it was closer to 15,000 because they only counted the men in the counts. And then picking up, what, 12 baskets of crumbs to follow after that? I guess they gave that to the mission there. Red Cross or whatever. The gleanings were picked up. <laughs> waste nothing. Waste not, want not. And yet they denied him and failed him when it was time for him to go to his crucifixion and time for him to be judged. They all fled. Every one of them fled. It's because it is the Word of God indwelling and the indwelling Holy Spirit that we have. They didn't have that. They didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. The disciples did not have that. That didn't come until after Pentecost. We don't sometimes realize just how much the Holy Spirit suppresses not only evil in the world, but unbelief in God's people. We sometimes take credit for it. We can't take any credit for having great faith and great belief in God. That is all, all we're doing is just availing ourselves to the Spirit's leadership. God's love has always been the same. It's never changed. God has love for the Old Testament saints is equal to His love for New Testament saints. But in the Old Testament, His love was shown by restraining sin through the means of fear and dread. The Bible says in Galatians that the law was like a schoolmaster, a tutor, to keep them in line. But today sin is restrained in the believer by the Word of God and the indwelling Holy Spirit. It is definitely a different day. Definitely a different day. Things have changed. And we will continue, Lord willing, next time. Father, we thank You for this day and for Your many blessings. We thank You for the encouragement of Your Word. We realize that You have done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We realize that You love us, that You care for us, that Your Spirit indwells us as New Testament believers and seals us into the day of our bodily redemption. We thank You that our salvation is secure because of who You are and your integrity to keep your word to us. We ask now that you would give us opportunities and show us ways that we can show the world and show our own families how much we love you, how much we believe in you, how much we dedicate this special time of year to reminding folks that are around us and family that is around us that Jesus Christ is definitely the reason for the season. That He's not only the reason for this season, but He's the reason for our existence, the reason for our hope, the reason for our joy. Thank You now for Your Word and for those who have come out. We ask You to bless the Word to each one of our souls. In Christ's name we pray and give thanks. Amen. We've studied so far um, five lessons. The Holy Spirit identified. The Holy Spirit's large, largeness, that is in his in the essence of God. Uh, time in the Holy Spirit. Uh, we ran a dispensational uh, run-through a couple of weeks ago from Old Testament through New Testament and beyond. And then uh, we looked at the Holy Spirit and Old Testament believers, how the Holy Spirit did uh, have uh, empowering and enduring strengthening. And we gave some examples, such as David and Samson, some others in the Old Testament, Saul, and how uh, the Holy Spirit worked with them, convicting them, trying to give them understanding of divine truth. We saw that. And then uh, 
We saw last Sunday morning the indwelling Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, the permanent residence, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And this morning we're going to look at the sealing of the Holy Spirit, S-E-A-L-I-N-G. And we'll look at that this morning, the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then Wednesday night, Lord willing, we'll be looking at the filling of the Holy Spirit, different aspects of the Holy Spirit's working in our life in the church age. And we closed out our lesson last, actually Sunday school morning. Most of you were here, I believe. But our last part that we looked at there regarding uh, that we are indwelt to learn truth, that was kind of summing up those uh, four different pages since this is page D or the fourth letter of the alphabet. That we are indwelt for a purpose, to learn truth. And the unsaved do not understand it. They cannot comprehend it because the Spirit is not in it teaching them. That's why I say what I say about uh, being unequally yoked in, in marriage. Uh, I know a lot of times we don't think about that, but uh, if a person becomes romantically and emotionally involved with someone, and, and that's the way it usually starts. It doesn't start out. And we, we marry, I, I married pretty young, and I was fortunate that my wife is a, is a, is a saved woman. But uh, at the time, we weren't thinking about that, and I wish I'd had more truth to understood that and maybe been a little more patient. And uh, I'm glad I got the one I got. But the truth of the matter is uh, the indwelling Holy Spirit is there to teach us truth. And the truth is uh, until the Holy Spirit is in there, you can't really learn truth. And without learning it, you don't have an appreciation for it. And I don't think any Christian is really successful until they have a real appreciation for learning the truth. Whether it's a little church or a big church. Secondly, we are indwelt to glorify God. That's 1 Corinthians 6.20 and Galatians 5.22. There is a purpose in the indwelling Holy Spirit. His, his desire is not to show of Himself as the Son and the Father do, and the Father will eventually, but uh, to glorify God. That's the purpose. And then uh, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit to witness concerning Jesus Christ. One of the things that Acts 1.8 says that the Holy Spirit would give us power to be witnesses throughout the world. That includes next door. A lot of people think that witnessing involves some rush to the jungle with a machete, but sometimes it might just be a walk 15 yards or some, some people 15 feet just to knock on the neighbor's door. We are indwelt to witness concerning Jesus Christ. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20 is another example that we have there. And so we go on a little bit further, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. The sealing of the Holy Spirit... And so this will be our sixth lesson. And the first point is that the Holy Spirit stays in us even when we are disobedient. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Here the believer is reminded of the eternal presence of the indwelling Holy Spirit. When the believer sins, the Holy Spirit does not leave the believer in the New Testament. It just simply grieves the Spirit of God within us. It grieves the Spirit of God within us. And I will say this, I don't know if I've got it in these notes today, if I can remember, but uh, for some of that might not be able to to make it on Wednesday night, uh, we're going to talk about the tenderness of the Holy Spirit in in that aspect of the filling of the Holy Spirit. And a little bit about the personal character of the Holy Spirit as opposed to the character of the Father and the character or personality of the Son. The Holy Spirit has His own personality. Uh, quite different from the Father, quite different from the Son. And uh, that's something that we'll be looking at as I thought I would bring that out, but it's more revealed in the notes and I hate to get off track and do that because that's been on my mind for several days, the personality of the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, Holy Spirit is a lot is a lot more tender with us than the Father or the Son would be. A lot of people talk about the the, the Son, you know, the sweet, gentle Jesus Christ. Um, but He's the same God that's the consuming fire. And the Holy Spirit is uh, certainly working with us. But think about the, 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 the Christ when He comes back in His second coming after the seven-year tribulation. And He's coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Uh, he's coming back with fire in his eyes. He's coming back and he's going to kill every human being on the face of the earth that is not a believer in Jesus Christ. Think about that. Every human being that is not killed through Armageddon, every unbeliever that is not that does not die, die at Armageddon will be killed by Christ even just speaking the death of all unbelievers, all the goats when he comes back and he establishes his kingdom. Because only believers in the Lord, whether they're in heaven or become believers on the earth during the tribulation, will go into his thousand-year reign. And the Father uh, is pictured as a, as a father of great wrath. But the Holy Spirit is never pictured as the one of great wrath. He is pictured as the one of tenderness. He is pictured as the one of affection. And we're going to bring out why the Holy Spirit has that personality trait uh, demonstrating that side of God uh, to the believer. I think it's very interesting. And just think that that Spirit is in you right now as it is in me. But let's get on with our study. We are not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And I kind of brought a little bit of that out before this coming Wednesday, because I want us to understand what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He's grieved. He's not, it doesn't say He's mad at us. It doesn't say, say He runs off to a corner and pounces in our soul somewhere. Or He shuffles His feet and whatever. He's grieved. The, Spirit is, the believer here is reminded of the eternal presence of the indwelling Spirit that when we sin... The Spirit of God stays, but stays greed. It doesn't say the Father stays greed, though the Father would be, and the Son would be. But it then, then the work of the Holy Spirit is, is a powerful job. The Spirit goes nowhere when we act in disobedience to God as it did in the Old Testament, as David said in Psalm 51.11, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Because he was not there to permanently indwell, but he was there to endue with power and to give uh, David a wisdom. Secondly, no one seals or saves themselves by religion, good works, or morals. We do not seal ourselves. God seals us. The word sealed here is an aorist passive indicative verb in the Greek text. I want to bring that out. But I want to say first is you do not seal yourself no more than you save yourself. Good works doesn't keep you sealed and protected to, to, to get to heaven. Religious observances and ritual keeping does not seal or keep us to heaven. And having good human morals, though we should have them. We should have, I don't want to call it religious, but at least worship uh, rit, worship two rituals in the church the, that are the... Uh, uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper, certainly we keep those, and we should do good works. The Bible says in Titus chapter 3 and verse 8 that we ought to be careful to maintain good works, and we should have high morals, walk as He walked, be ye holy as I am holy, the Lord said, but those don't seal us or save us. There are some Christians who believe that a Christian can lose their salvation if they're not moral enough, if they don't do enough good works to show their faith in Christ. But if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're sealed. The word sealed there in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. It's the same word as used in Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and verse 18 where it says, In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the sealed word here in Ephesians 4 30 as well as 113. 
is the word spragizo, S-P-R-A-S-P-H-R-A-G-I-Z-O. Spragizo is the word there for both places. And it shows authority, ownership, inheritance, and guarantee. That's what that word spragizo means. It's an aorist tense verb, a passive voice, and an indicative mood verb that the Holy Spirit Himself chose to show us the meaning of this word. So that's significant. So let's shuck this corn down to the cob. Sealing is illustrated by God's signet ring. Revelation 7.2 shows God's authority. Shows God's authority. So one of the ways that a seal was given in those days is that a, a king or a great ruler or a businessman would have, a, have, have his inscription on a seal and he would use a wax. And the, he would put a puddle of wax down and he would either put his hand in it or he'd put his ring in it and it would leave the imprint and once it dried, it, the imprint would have it and they would use it to seal a letter or a document. And the seal told where the orient, where the, uh, where this document originated from, and it showed the guarantee of the one who put the seal on it as being uh, secure. You don't have to worry about it. Break, that the king or that person or that businessman breaking his word. His seal was his guarantee. And God, according to Revelation seven two, has a has a ring. It pictures God's sealing. Remember that the the uh, John said that the angels tried to find someone to open up the the seven scrolls the seven seals, and there was no one found able. And God the Father had put His seal on the seven seals. And only the Lamb of God was worthy to open up the seals. And opening up the seals demonstrated Christ's ownership of the universe. So there's the word sealing there. And it was a picture of a signet ring. And then there is the inscription of a seal. I'll just give them all to you. I hope they don't distract you. But the seal is described by its origins in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. Paul said, He says, For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto the bonds, but by the word of God that is bound, I am not bound. And then he said, regarding the saints, that they were his seal. Proof that they were there because of the salvation, that they were proof of his, the salvation that came through the word. It was, it, it was, uh, it, it showed the, uh, the, 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 the guarantee of that. Then the seal is a token of proof. The seal is inscribed by its origins and it's also a token of proof. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Second, uh, yeah, chapter 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear has heard, neither is in the heart of the man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. All those things that are there, they're revealed by the Spirit of God unto man. All those things are there, there for people to understand. All these things are there for our understanding and for our guidance. Guaranteed that things will be there. A seal is a token of guarantee. Romans chapter 4 and verse 11, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Romans chapter 4 and verse 11, it, the seal there was circumcision. And Abraham received that seal as a token to God that he believed in Christ and that righteousness of God was imputed unto him. And God said that he would be saved based upon his faith. It's a token of guarantee. It shows ownership and that the intent is real. That the intent is real. A real intent. And that, that was very significant to see that. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 2, If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship 
are ye in the Lord. The seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 2. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. And so he was showing there that there was a token of proof that what they were was a result of the gospel that he had preached to them. Now let's look at this word and break it down a little bit. The seal is the token of proof. It should be 1 Corinthians 9 to not 2, 9. All right. The Greek verb seal. We're here to learn. Let's learn this. There are different voices in the Greek text, and they give meaning to the word, whether it's a participle or a verb. And so it's important for us to understand that a participle is just an adjectival noun, or it's descriptive of the person or a noun, pretty much uh, just as an adjective, but we call it a participle. It's almost like a verb, but it's a noun. It's called a participle. That's what's in between there. But the verb sealed, Ephesians 1.13 and 4.30, the same word, spragizo, means to have, the passive voice means that we have no hand in our sealing. This is important. A lot of people think that they have to do something or they can do something to break the seal. People who do not believe in eternal security do not believe in the sealing of the Holy Spirit or if they say they do, they believe that you can break the seal. You cannot break the seal. The passive voice means the Holy Spirit seals us totally without any help from us. You don't have to run down the aisle to get sealed in. You don't have to throw money in the plate to get sealed in. You don't have to get all emotional to be sealed in. You don't have to go back in a room somewhere and explain all your dirty little sins to somebody to get sealed in. You don't have to have a great big public demonstration to get sealed in. You can be hanging ragged on the side of the cross and get sealed in. The passive voice means the Holy Spirit, and the word and the passive voice there is just a way that that particular verb is written. A verb or a, a verb in the Greek text, which is an action word, sealed is an action word, and we're sealed by the action of the Holy Spirit. An action word, a verb in the Greek text can be translated five hundred different and five hundred different variations. That's a lot of variations because there's a way that we have a language that is a dead language from that day, so it's not changed, so it, it, it is fixed. And that's why I don't have to rely on just one translation uh, of the, the original text in order to actively preach and accurately preach the Word of God because I don't rely on the translation. I rely on the original text, which most men don't take the time to do anymore, which bores most Christians. But you need to know the accuracy <clears throat> of your Bible. There are kids that carry history books home that don't read the history, that fail the history test. But they have a book that has the history in it. Hopefully that history is written right. I don't know, but that's not the point here. The point is, is that it's in your Bible. You don't see it, but it's in there. And so that passive voice means the subject of the verb receives the action. The action is produced by the Holy Spirit. We are recipients of that sealing. Secondly, the aorist tense is important. The tense gives the time. The tense gives the time. Whether it's past time, present time, future time, whether it's action that was completed in the past time that has present results, whether it's action that is continuous, or whether it is action that is undefined. In other words, the aorist tense is action that's undefined. In other words, it doesn't tell you specifically if it was something that happened at the time that you became a Christian, or the time that you're presently living your Christian life, or the time when you're going to be in the heavens with the Lord. It doesn't know. It just tells you that there's the beginning of the train leaving the station, the duration of the trip the train takes us, which we're on now called the Christian way of life, or the destination when we get to heaven. That's the aorist tense. It's called action undefined. And that's what that means. And the aorist tense is used here. But it shows completeness. The aorist tense signifies 
that the sealing of the Holy Spirit is permanent. Whether it's when you were first sealed, you're sealed all the way through your Christian life, all the way to the end. You're not sealed until you get become so bad that God just can't stand you anymore. You stink spiritually so bad, He just can't take it anymore. That's when He takes you home to glory. Or it leaves you to wrangle and, 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 and willow and wane in your faith and, and, that, and, and, and to maybe be a strengthening voice for someone else as they have to deal with you. As one preacher says, unto everyone's life a little rain must fall. That's the way it is with some Christians. They're the rain that's always pecking on the soul of someone else. doesn't have to be that way. The heiress tent signifies the act of the sealing as being complete. And that's all in that same word, spragizo. It's the way it ends. It's a particular vowel or consonant that is used in the ending or the beginning of the word. That's all there is to. If you were to look into an analytical lexicon which tells you all the breakdowns of these different verbs or the things that I bring out, if you were to look at all the breakdowns, you'd have pages and pages sometimes of nothing more than just one word and all the different variations that that can be used to make that word what it is that matches your text. And that's that's what I do. That's why I don't have anything up here anymore. But that's okay. You know that's okay. But it signifies that the act of the sealing, when you get saved, it is complete. And it also signifies that it only occurs one time. You don't get saved and then do something bad, and then go back to church after a few years or a little bit of time and get saved again. You just confess your known sin and get back in the saddle and prove your loyalty to your Lord. That's what you and I do. I've had to do it, and you've had to do it too. We all do it. From time to time. Some longer times in between. But that doesn't matter. past is the past. But you only get sealed one time. And it's a good enough sealing to keep you. You don't have to get resealed like, you know, the sealing cracks like caulking around a window. Oh, we need to knock that out and put some new sealing in. There is not a thing in the world wrong with the seal. It's just the window's cracked. The seal is just fine. We'll just replace the window. God just changes our hearts if we'll let Him. But the seal is fine. The seal is fine. It only occurs one time. Which means that if a person believes they can lose their salvation, if they believe that, then they can never get saved again. Tell people who believe that they can lose their salvation, well, if you lose it, you'll never get saved again because you only get sealed one time. You only get sealed once. You don't get resealed when you get back in the fold. You only get sealed one time. Once saved, always saved is the, is the saying that a lot of people don't like because they believe it's arrogance. No, to believe that you're once saved and can't be always saved, that's the arrogance. Because you're predicating your eternal security not on the faithfulness of God to His Word, but you as a nasty, stupid human being being able to be good enough to keep your salvation. Because a lot of times the people that believe they're good enough to keep their salvation secretly believe they're good enough to have earned it to start with. But they had something about their personality. They had something about their do-gooders mentality. They had something about their morality. They had something about some deed that they had done that just... They knew astonished God to no end. Arrogant people. Arrogant people are the ones who believe they can lose their salvation, not people who don't believe they can lose their salvation. Because arrogant people don't think that God is good for His Word. They don't trust God. And they despise you for trusting God. And so they'll call you all kinds of names because really... They're, you know, I was saying, every time you, somebody's pointing one finger at you, there's at least three, maybe four pointing back at them. And then the third thing is that it's in the indicative mood. There are moods. The Holy Spirit is moody. There are moods. And here we have the indicative mood. 
That's built into the word itself. The indicative mood shows the certainty. It shows certainty here in which the Holy Spirit, without any element of doubt, seals the believer forever at the moment of salvation. Because the air is tense, shows that it's a once and for all, all, for all act. It occurs at the moment that you believe. The passive voice shows that the Holy Spirit does all of the sealing. And the indicative mood means there's no element of doubt that you are sealed forever at the moment of salvation. That's important. That's very important. The redemption to which we are sealed, as noted in Ephesians 4.30, speaks of the ultimate redemption of the believer as he experiences soul and body united at the rapture of the church. The rapture is the resurrection of all New Testament saints at the end of the church age. This is significant. The redemption to which we are sealed is noted in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. Speaks of the ultimate redemption of the believer as he experiences soul and body united at the rapture. We are sealed unto the day of redemption, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 says. Sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. It's not talking about you earning your redemption or your soul salvation. It refers to the bodily, bodily redemption when you go to be with the Lord. The rapture is the resurrection of New Testament saints, which takes place at the end of the dispensation of the church age. The rapture, again, it is the resurrection of all New Testament saints. And again, the resurrection is not just one great general grand uh, resurrection at the end of time, after everybody has died and God says, okay, we're, you know, people that don't believe in the rapture at all. There are people who don't believe in the rapture at all. How do they think at the end of time the people that are living are going to get into the third heaven? Duh! There's going to be billions of people on the earth at the end of time. How are they supposed to get into the third heaven to be judged? To be separated from the left, from the right? That is, from the liberals, from the concerned. No. no, I'm just teasing about that. The goats from the sheep. <laughs> if you would follow that analogy, I would say that sheep really are dumb if they are the right if you put it politically speaking. And I am one of the dumb, I guess. But to bring it back to what we're saying here, is that the rapture of the church is when the believer gets the redeemed body, where the body and the soul are united once again. Okay? For all eternity. The rapture is the resurrection of New Testament saints. And it happens at the end of the church age. And if the end of the church age were to happen right now, you and I would be raptured into heaven. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't be slumped over in the, in the pews. Uh, we would be raptured out bodily. Bodily. We'd be missing MIAs, missing in action, and we'd be with the Lord. And that tribulation would be beginning on the earth. The Antichrist would start his false peace uh, talks in, in, in the Holy Land. And we'll be out of here. But the soul is purchased completely at the moment of salvation. The word redemption means to purchase by a price. And you are purchased totally at the moment of salvation. And you are kept totally by God's Spirit until it's time for you to get your new body. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5 says that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. So we are kept by the power of God. And what was the Holy Spirit given to the believer for? Power. God's power. It is not a diminished power. If God is at a 440 or a 220, then so is the Son and so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's got just as much juice in Him, if you want to call it spiritual electricity, as the Father and the Son do. There is no minimization of authority and power, just position in the Trinity. 
The Holy Spirit is no less God than the Father Himself. And so often the Holy Spirit is minimized as some sort of a holy roller show or some fantastic emotional experience. How stupid. How demeaning. How that quenches the Holy Spirit. But after the believer is raptured into the heavens, from then on it's the judgment seat of Christ for personal accountability. Then hopefully we earn rewards by having a good personal accountability of our life as Christians. And then from then on, ultimate glorification in our glorified bodies with Christ throughout all eternity. Now, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 for a few minutes, back up to the first chapter, and we'll look at that just for a minute. Ephesians 1 and verse 13 gives the order in which a person is sealed. Ephesians 1 13 gives the order in which a person who comes to Christ, who accepts Christ as Savior, is sealed. If someone accepts Christ in my study or here in the auditorium, they are sealed the moment they believe. And I don't ask them to have to come forward. I don't prevent people from doing it, but I don't ask them to do that. I don't want to confuse the issue. But Ephesians 1.13 gives the order in which a person is sealed and secured eternally by the Holy Spirit of promise. And he is called the Holy Spirit of promise at the end of verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 1. It says, "...and whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, not after, but when you believed." In the Greek text, the word thereafter, that preposition is incorrect. It is when. When you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise." Now, a lot of times when I'll bring uh, this out, I, maybe we've had some people here in the past that were very familiar with one translation and they really believed in it heavily. I, matter of fact, some of the men that I had read from, uh, that they believe it's actually wrong to use even Greek text when you're studying the King James that you should, all you need is a good standard American dictionary. I'll tell you. That'd be like going off to war and having a private lead the war. You need people who are trained and know the Word, who are going to preach the Word. And don't play down dumb to the congregation because you think that, you know, they don't have the ability to understand the truth. You do have the ability to understand it. The reason why there is so much trouble in Christianity and lack of edification in the body of Christ, which led is leading to the fall of America is because of the ignorance of Christians today. I, I am never going to be one to be complacent with ignorance. I've had people tell me that I can't learn it. That's just too much. No, it's not too much over your head. There's people who can take technical manuals and break them down, schematics of electronic diagrams and charts, and break down all kinds of blueprints and stuff, but yet they'll play dumb when it comes to learning something such as language. You people learn what they want to learn. And so it's important for us as Christians to learn learn the Bible. But there is an order here of our sealing. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13, he says, First of all, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. You heard the word of truth. Hear the word of truth. That's the first thing. That's the order of being sealed. You hear the word of truth. You hear the word of truth of the gospel. First Corinthians fifteen one through four gives that this is according to the scripture. And what does First Corinthians fifteen one through four tell us? Well, particularly verses three and four tells us the salvation message that you personally believe that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. And that He was buried and that He rose the third day according to the Scriptures. And you hear that gospel of truth. That's called the good news. The word gospel means good news. Euagalion means good news. You hear the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation. 
You heard that gospel. That's the first thing that is involved in sealing. You first have to hear the gospel. And secondly, you believe. The word believe, pistuo, means to accept or to acknowledge, to receive. You believe the gospel of what you are and who Christ is. It says, in whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also when you believed. See, you believed then. You believe the gospel, the good news of your soul salvation. This means you accept who Christ is, who you are as a sinner, and you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's believing the gospel. The gospel does us no good if we do not accept Jesus Christ after hearing it. And there are people who can come and hear the gospel week after week after week and still not accept it, but they know it. But they don't accept it. It doesn't do them any good. The gospel does us no good if we do not receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Otherwise, the life and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's just another Bible story to them. It's just another Bible story. Make sure that Jesus Christ and what He's done for you and saving you as He has done me, that it's not just another Bible story to you. It's not just another story like Adam and Eve. It's not another story like Samson and Delilah or Mo, uh, Moses and the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea or, or Paul and Peter preaching their sermons in the beginning of the church age or, or anything else. Or Jesus feeding the 5,000 on the hillside, the, the five pieces of bread and a couple of fish. Those, those are true stories, don't get me wrong, and they all are real and they have significance. But for some people, those are just literature stories. And they like the literature stories. Well, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have to make sure that it's more than just literature or just another Bible story. You really believe it. And I have witnessed to people. Here recently I witnessed to a person and I went down to the gospel from A to Z. And uh, I don't know. It's like it's another Bible story. Good story. What is it to me? Until the Holy Spirit convicts a person that they're lost, they stay lost. I can't convict a person that they're lost. You can't convict a person that they're lost. They have to be convicted and convinced that they're lost. But as soon as you do believe, as soon as you believe that gospel message, sealing is instant the moment you believe. It says there in verse 13, "...in whom also after you believed, you were sealed." And that's instant sealing. It's not like, you know, six months down the road and God's got you on a probation period. The word believed is from pistua and it means to put your assurance in. Put your faith in. Put your faith in. That's what that means. Now, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee. We talked about that in our first page of notes here. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our eternal security. He's the guarantee of our eternal security. Which after you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Remember the ring. Remember it puts down the imprint. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is the promise. You've heard of the promise keepers. You've heard of a man giving his girlfriend a promise ring. They used to call them promise rings years ago. Promise that we'll be true to one another. The promise ring. People make a promise to others. I, I've made promises to people, and I had to say this in 56 years. I know there's been times that I've probably broken my promises. I've tried to not break my promises. And we need to be careful that when we do make a promise that we think about it before we make it if we're really going to commit ourselves to doing it or we're just trying to skate during the moment with a person. But when God makes a promise... We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is actually God's seal. It's, he's actually that stamp. <laughs> he's sealed in us. You're just not sealed inside the body of Christ. But the Holy Spirit is sealed in you. And He's like a down payment of more to come. He is a portion of our heavenly inheritance. 
The Holy Spirit is a portion of our divine inheritance. It says in verse 14, regarding the Holy Spirit of promise, who, referring to the Holy Spirit, is the earnest of our inheritance. The word earnest means down payment. Down payment. The Holy Spirit is a portion of our divine inheritance. He is the earnest. He is the down payment of our eternal inheritance. And He is ours forever. But He is there to see us through until the redemption of the purchased possession. You were purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. By the soul of Jesus Christ. You were purchased. You were deemed agarazzo. You were purchased and you were bought out of the slave market of sin. You were bought out of the slave market of sin never to be put up for sale again. You were purchased. The Holy Spirit is that down payment that is staying with you. You are a purchased possession. And that includes you guaranteed, you being guaranteed a glorified body, a resurrected body at the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 18. The word earnest, Arabon, A-R-R-A-B-O-N, Arabon, means a pledge or a deposit. And I know I'm just saying two words. It means a pledge or a deposit. But I don't know how many big old fat thick books I got out looking at the best definition for the word earnest. I used to have a friend when I was in high school. His name was Ernest. Went to the same Bible college I went to eventually. But the word Ernest Arabon means a pledge or a deposit. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise who is the pledge of our inheritance. He is the deposit of our inheritance. And God does not share His inheritance with the lost. Once you believe in Jesus Christ, He starts immediately sharing His inheritance with you. God never breaks His guarantees. Once the Lord makes a pledge, He doesn't break His pledge for any reason. He is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, which is you and me. We are purchased by the blood of Christ. Once you receive Christ as Savior, your sins are covered. Your life has been bought. Your soul has been redeemed. It has been saved. And you are now a possession of the Father. And that's the way the Father says, of those, of those that I give to my Son, I will lose nothing. God will lose none of His precious children who have received Christ by faith. And for any of God's precious children who have received Christ by faith to say, My Father, I cannot trust. What do you think that does to the indwelling Holy Spirit? It grieves the Spirit. The ceiling, if you have any friends who do not believe in eternal security, they need to hear this message. And they need to get off of their pity pots and stop focusing on their ability, but God's ability. God doesn't seal us and keep us because we deserve it. And people who do not believe in eternal security, and I've known quite a few, they think they have to do something to deserve being kept. They cannot do anything to deserve being kept. They don't deserve to be kept. And neither do I, neither do you. And that's because the ceiling is not based upon what you deserve or what I deserve. It's based upon what God did for you. And it's a completed salvation. And as I said, if someone believes they can lose their salvation, remind them that the salvation in the ceiling is aorist tense, which means they can't get sealed again. Just give up. Don't try again. They'll stop that racket of saying, I've got to get saved again. They'll stop that racket and that foolishness. They are an emotional revolt of the soul. They just are disobedient and they don't want to admit it. They stay in perpetual childlessness. It's always about them. It's never about him. He gets a token lip service, but not from the heart. Lastly, Again, God doesn't break His guarantee. The Holy Spirit is that guarantee. 
Lastly, the seal cannot be broken from the inside or the outside. Because there are people who say, well, I know that God won't, won't break His Word with me, but I, I, might, I, might, I, might, I might stray and I'll break my Word with Him. And, I, uh, you know, it'd be my fault. I admit it, it's, it's my, I'm just bad. And also, not bad, but also misinformed. God cannot lie like a man. He does not go back on His Word. He never does. Once the Lord makes a pledge, He doesn't break His pledge. And the sealing of the Holy Spirit puts the believer in an unbreakable circle which cannot be penetrated from inside or outside. No one and no thing can pull you out and no act on your part can make you break out. Turn just for a moment as we're closing to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 6. John, chapter 6. And some people think, well, if I sin I'm, or I, I get to where I get into a sinful pattern in my life, I, I couldn't be saved. Because they don't believe a person could be saved and be that way. They're wrong. <laughs> they're grieving the Holy Spirit. People are grieving the Holy Spirit. But if they're truly born again, look at this. John chapter 6, verse 37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, that is by free will, I will in no wise cast... In no wise means for any reason. People need to read that verse. He says, I will in no wise cast out. And that means for no reason. Look, a lot of people don't believe. They don't understand. They're saved by grace and they're kept by grace. Verse 39 says, And this is the Father's will who hath sent me. But of all that He hath given me, perfect tense, which means completed action and past time having present results, of all that He hath given me, I should lose only the bad ones. No, He says I'll lose nothing, not one. But should raise that up, that up, or it up again at the last day. That's the rapture. So there is no casting out and no losing or losing believers in Christ. Now look at John chapter 10, verse 28 as we close. John 10, 28. John 10 and verse 28. It says, uh, verse 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And look at verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life. When does He give you eternal life? When you believe in Christ. Not when you die. Right now, I'm not afraid of dying because I have eternal life. And His Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I don't have to worry about it. So I might eat two pieces of pie for lunch if I've got one or something. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall what? Perish when they become a bad girl or a bad boy, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them. Any is the interrogative pronoun, tis, T-I-S, and that includes you. You can't even pluck yourself out of the Father's hand. I don't know whether you've had that explained to you or not, but that interrogative pronoun, T-I-S, or tis, refers to everybody. That would include yourself. You can't pluck yourself out of the Father's hand. The Father who gave them to me is greater than all, which means He's greater than the sinner thinking that he can get himself unsaved by some dumb or potentially uh, terrible sinful thing that he or she may do. Look at that again. My Father who gave them to me, when? At salvation, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And the word pluck means to see. There's no casting out and there's no plucking. You can't cast yourself out and you can't be plucked out and you will not be denied. You might lose reward, but you won't lose your salvation. Father, we thank You for this day and for Your Word and we thank You for sealing us, keeping us by Your grace. We know we don't deserve it. We know we can't earn it, but we are so thankful for it. And we ask You to help us to not neglect that so great salvation but to stay faithful to the Word because you're worth it. And we love you for all you do for us. In Christ's name, amen.